Okay, mark one. It was uh, on my 54th mission uh, uh, over North Vietnam that uh, I was shot down. And I was flying, as I always uh, uh, flew, a electronic countermeasures uh, mission supporting strike aircraft. For instance, airplanes like John's uh, uh, strikes, uh, where we could jam the enemy radar uh, that was uh, uh, guiding uh, anti-aircraft artillery or surface-to-air missiles. Uh, so that they couldn't pick up the strike aircraft and then launch their, uh, their weapon systems after them. So I was jamming, I was jamming, and we were also uh, doing electri a little bit of electronic reconnaissance, you know, picking up uh, unusual signals, signals uh, perhaps that identified a site of some importance that uh, we hadn't uh, included on our, on our uh, order of battle charts. And on this 54th mission, I had just finished the inbound leg going from west to east, when uh, the North Vietnamese launched uh, four missiles at the airplane. Uh, we had flown over a site that uh, was not charted. We didn't know it was there. It was a mobile site and most likely had been uh, moved there uh, under our flight path uh, on, overnight. And uh, when they moved it there, we didn't know it was there. Flew over the top of it. It was like shooting fish in a barrel, really. Uh, we couldn't get away and uh, I turned into a bank uh, when I was warned of it initially, but it was too late. And uh, one missile of the four uh, did slight damage, and then the uh, third one actually impacted the airplane and killed uh, three of my uh, crew members in the back end, the ones that do all the electronic heavy lifting, for instance, uh, and uh, we call them Ravens, electronic warfare officers. Uh, killed three of them uh, uh, right off the bat. One of them ejected and, and became a POW, uh, with me and the navigator and I both ejected and became POWs as well. So there were three of us that actually successfully escaped from the airplane. So on this airplane I was the pilot. I was the pilot and I had a navigator sitting just off to the side behind me and uh, I was flying the airplane. That was my responsibility to uh, fly the pre-planned orbit uh, pattern and uh, uh, while I was flying this orbit pattern, uh, the uh, fellows in the back end, the four officers in the back end, were doing electronic uh, surveillance, if you want to call that. They were uh, what we call cutting uh, signals uh, from the ground. Uh, when they got a threat signal, uh, on either over their headset or on the scope that they had in the back end on their equipment, they would either jam it, or if it wasn't a threat, they would log it on the chart just to confirm that it was there. Or if it was a new site, then they'd put that on the chart and the location. And then when we went back after the mission, we would brief that to the intelligence people and they would include that in their next briefing for the next crew that flew up there. So uh, the bottom line is I was flying a reconnaissance uh, as well as jamming uh, uh, radar signals um, in support of strikes. This was, as I recall, this was a Sunday. This was a Sunday, the 4th of, uh, of uh, February, 1967. Right. From the sky, it was, uh, it was mountainous. It was uh, in the, uh, the area of Hanoi, but we were north of Hanoi, out of the threat uh, of uh, surface-to-air missiles. They were our biggest threat. Surface-to-air missiles were our biggest threat because we were pretty much out of range of the anti-aircraft artillery, the AAA. Uh, so it was the missiles, which had a very, very high effective uh, altitude, and it had a, uh, a, a circular range that uh, could be lethal if we got inside of that range close to the defended areas. Uh, and you, you might recall, too, that uh, Hanoi, was in the history of aerial warfare the most heavily defended target area uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in history. It came as a complete, complete surprise to me. Uh, in other words, uh, when those missiles exploded and uh, destroyed the airplane, forced 
uh, me to eject from the airplane came as a complete surprise because our flight path uh, was supposed to be planned so that we stayed outside of those lethal surface air missile rings. And by flying over one of them, however, uh, we negated any of that insurance and we got shot down. So uh, I was shocked into a really out of, uh, in a sense, out of complacency because uh, I was very comfortable doing what I had done 53 times before. And on this 54th mission, boom, 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 uh, the explosion of the missiles destroyed the airplane, couldn't fly it anymore. Uh, I had to get out of it. So I ejected from the airplane after the navigator uh, ejected. And I came down uh, and landed in my parachute. Uh, but I was pretty well banged up uh, by, the, uh, by the shrapnel and also uh, ejecting from the airplane. Uh, something had gone haywire with uh, the equipment in the sense that the ejection seat did not fully uh, uh, move to the aft position. And so when I went through the overhead hatch, I went through and got shredded sort of much, sort of like a head of lettuce. Uh, I got to my, my flight suit ripped uh, significantly. I had lacerations on my body, a very severe one on my knee. And uh, so uh, when I went out of the airplane at that altitude in my haste, I forgot to pull down my uh, uh, visor, which was both a sun visor and a uh, visor to protect your eyes from the, from the airstream, the slipstream, uh, if you have to eject. And when that happened, the slipstream at 450 knots uh, hit me right square in the eyes and I was immediately blinded. Uh, I couldn't see a darn thing. Uh, and so I tumbled through the sky and uh, eventually I got down, I would estimate probably somewhere around uh, 20,000 feet, 18,000 feet. And I pulled the ripcord and uh, I uh, uh, deployed the parachute and I came down very near a village. And uh, when I got down on the ground, I got out of my, uh, my uh, parachute harness and that sort of thing. I kept my survival vest on, which had a minimal amount of equipment with it. And I bandaged my lacerations and uh, took some sulfa tablets out of my first aid kit to, I thought, prevent some infection if that should happen. And I started to, to evade. And I ran up the hill and uh, I reached a point where there were brambles and underbrush and uh, uh, tangle entanglements uh, uh, from the foliage and I couldn't go any further. So I thought, I've got to find a place to hide. So I looked around and I find a, found a very small banana palm. It was only about, I'd say, nine inches in diameter. And so I was dressed in an olive green uh, or olive drab flight suit, which blended in with the surrounding uh, uh, foliage. And so I squeezed in behind this. Uh, you can see I'm wider than nine inches, but I squeezed in and was very quiet uh, behind this uh, palm, banana palm, and it was uh, five or ten minutes. The villagers, the villagers from uh, uh, from nearby, came with their dogs, came rushing up the hill, and believe it or not, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't believe it. They ran right by me. I ran right by me because I looked, uh, uh, you know, like I was part of the palm tree, I guess, a banana palm, and. Uh, they reached the same obstacles that I had reached, the undergrowth, the brambles, the vines, that sort of stuff. And I heard them stop, and I ominously felt them all stop, turn around, and look back down the hill from where they had come and from where I had come to my location. And then all heck broke loose. I, uh, the dogs barked, uh, people screaming and hollering, and they surrounded me and they pointed their ancient looking rifles and uh, they were carrying uh, sickles that uh, the local people used for harvesting uh, rice. And they had those as weapons and uh, so they, they pounced on me, so to speak, not with uh, any violence or anything, but just surrounded me, grabbed my 38 and uh, pointed that at me and uh, I look back on it now and I think I did something very stupid in my shocked state. Uh, I reached out. I reached out to the one villager that was pointing my 38, my Smith & Wesson at me, right in the middle of my uh, breastbone, so to speak, here. And I reached out and I pushed it away. I said, don't, in English, I said, don't point that at me. It might go off. 
And of course, I'm in a state of shock and I'm a little bit disoriented and all that sort of stuff. And so he did. He uh, pointed it away from me and he stripped me from, with, uh, stripped me from all my clothes. Took my flight suit, uh, put, took my wallet, uh, my identification card and my Geneva Convention card and uh, took my boots, left me in my socks and in bloody underwear. Uh, I had a, one of those tank tops that uh, we, I wore over there because of the heat and I had a pair of boxer shorts on just covered with blood from, uh, from the uh, shrapnel wounds. At this, point, at this point, I didn't know where that blood came from because I did not see uh, the disintegration of the side of the airplane. I didn't see the disintegration of uh, anything that would lead me to believe that the airplane had been that severely damaged. Uh, and so when I went out of the airplane, I went out thinking, you know, that, uh, that uh, it had been uh, hit by missiles, but I didn't, uh, I, I didn't know that I was wounded as well. And later on, I found out in prison that the navigator, the navigator received shrapnel wounds too. And of course, it killed three guys in the back end because the missile actually impacted them. So there I am now on the ground, uh, surrounded by the villagers, and uh, the long day's night begins. And I marched off uh, through rice paddies, uh, along, along, along the periphery of rice paddies, lined by peasants, very curious peasants, non-committal, they weren't ang angry, uh, they, they weren't rushing at me like unfortunately some other pilots had been uh, physically abused. They just, uh, they just uh, watched me being escorted along the path in, in, my, in my, uh, my shorts and in my tank top. And believe it or not, I, I, I couldn't believe this, but uh, a young lady uh, dressed in a military uniform came rushing up, obviously been notified that this pilot was injured, came rushing up and bandaged all of my wounds, put a nice pad on my knee that was badly lacerated, and then uh, another uh, uh, young uh, military guy came out of the crowd as I'm walking along and took my picture. And I remember, I remember saying to myself sort of sardonically, you might say, or cynically, whatever, I said, oh, it's probably a Japanese camera too. <laughs> but anyway, he took my picture. And then somebody else, because I looked rather embarrassing uh, with just shorts and a, and a tank top on, came out of the crowd and gave me a pair of trousers. So, sort of knee-length, knee-length trousers that uh, you know Asian folks wear uh, when they work in the rice paddies and things like that. So, there I was. I marched off to the to the to the uh, to the uh, to the village. Uh, there was a, a political rally that the, com the that the village commissar conducted. He marched me out in front of all the assembled people from that village and said something in Vietnamese and shook his fist and pointed at me. And then the crowd responded with a lot of, uh, we always used to say uh, humorously, hoota, 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 because we couldn't understand their language. So uh, that's what it sounded like came back in my direction. And, and then I was taken back in the village headman's house, sat there, and uh, I waited for the army to show up. Uh, uh, and they threw me in the back end of a kind of a, a vehicle about the size of one of our Hummers, uh, but military. And uh, I rode the rest of the time into the Hanoi Hilton uh, all night. And this was all, this was the night of the fourth. This was the night of the fourth. It was, uh, first of all, I was blindfolded from the time I got into the vehicle until I arrived uh, in the interrogation room. I was, uh, I was blindfolded, so I didn't see, and it was night, night, it was dark, so I didn't see a lot. Um, and so when we got uh, outside the prison camp, it was before Reveille, so to speak, nobody had been awakened yet, so uh, I heard this clang, 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 which I was gonna, uh, going to be familiar with for the next six years, and that was the Reveille sign, you know, sound. And so uh, when that happened, the gates were opened, and uh, they drove us through uh, into, the, uh, into the area of uh, the Hilton and offloaded me and took me to uh, a room uh, that uh, resided in, in an area we called New Guy Village because it was an in, sort of an in-processing center. 
So they brought me into New Guy Village and into a room, it was about 20 by 20 in, in feet in size, and it had lumpy uh, walls. Uh, we called it the knobby walled room. Uh, it was an interrogation room, uh, virtually soundproof uh, from outside. And uh, there was a desk uh, in front with an old lamp sitting on it, something like a 1930s lamp that we would see in the United States, and a small stool in front of the table. And I had been standing there for, oh, five, six minutes or so, and finally the interrogator came in. A very knowledgeable guy, we nicknamed him, uh, and I'm still standing, uh, knowledgeable, we called him the Eagle. Uh, it came in with a big folder loaded with charts, loaded with aviation uh, checklists, uh, things related to strike missions and things like that. And he came in and he started, uh, first of all, you know, uh, what is your name? And gave him a name. What's your rank? Rank. Gave him that. And uh, how old are you? Uh, you know, I told, gave him my age. I figured... Well, it's not exactly like, like a date of birth, like the, the, you're required to give according to Geneva Convention uh, uh, rules, but eh, I guess 29 is okay. See, I was real suspicious. I did not ever want to do anything that would embarrass my family name. My father raised my brother and I very strictly, and my mom too, uh, very strictly. Never, ever, ever, he said, bring shame on the name of the Fur family. Don't you ever do it. I'll kick your up between your shoulder blades if you do that. And uh, so we, I, I grew up with a very regimented uh, code of, uh, you know, uh, discipline and ethical behavior and things like that because my father was a fire captain. He's well known in town. And uh, his, his, if, if it ever got out that his son had done something embarrassing, it would have come right back home to roost and he would have been very upset. So I was always suspicious of anything that the communists would ask me that was out of the ordinary. And silly as it may seem, how old are you wasn't according to the date of birth. In other words, he, he asked me for my name, my rank, uh, my uh, uh, service number. He, he, didn't, uh, he gave, got my service number and date of birth. And instead of that, specifically, he said, how old are you? And I thought it was a trick question. Is, and I was a little bit still in shock and a little disoriented. And I told him, well, I'm 29 years old. Okay, then we moved on. And he said, now what are the targets going to be after Tet? As you know, Tet is the Lunar New Year over there. And Lyndon Johnson always used to halt the bombing over the north, particularly in the Hanoi area, uh, during our Christmas holidays uh, through New Year's or the Lunar New Year, their Tet celebration in North Vietnam. And so uh, I got shot down on the front edge of time that just uh, uh, pre uh, uh, prelim uh, was a prelim to Tet. And so he was anticipating another bombing halt. And so the Eagle said, what are the targets going to be after Tet? And of course, even though I, I uh, helped to uh, disseminate target information to other air crews. We called it breaking the frags, fragmentary orders. Uh, even though I helped do that, I was on those teams, those frag teams, I never knew in anticipation of that what the targets would be because uh, the ones that we, we supported were all what we called uh, JCS targets, specifically designed, picked, and executed by uh, ex executive order, the President of the United States, down through the chain of command. So I had no idea what those were. They're very high priority targets. So what are the targets going to be after Tet? I said, I don't know. So then he proceeded to uh, use his torture methods to try to get information out of me. And I resisted it twice. I resisted it twice. And finally, uh, when I got out of the ropes, when they tied us up into ropes with torture and all that sort of thing, when I got out of the, uh, out of the ropes the second time, uh, the pain had built up so greatly with the cutting off my circulation, uh, handcuffs were very tight, cutting into the tendons and all that sort of stuff. I made up targets. I just made up information for him. But I made it so simple, I made it so simple that as we're instructed, 
I wouldn't forget and get caught in a lie. Because when you're in a beaten down state with uh, this severe interrogation and you lie about it, then the interrogator is smart enough to come back a second time, ask you the same questions, maybe days later, uh, hours later, whatever it happens to be, and say, you told us this when the facts are these. Now, the facts may be distorted, they may be fabricated, but now he's preying on my, uh, my pain and my uh, feeling of, uh, of uh, alienation from America and my crew members and all that stuff and all the other things that go with getting shot down, that now I'm gonna say, okay, here's the truth. You know, and then I'll spill the beans. Once you open that door, then you become susceptible to exploitation for a lot of things, including ultimately propaganda, signing uh, uh, war crimes confessions. Um, in Korea, it was germ warfare. Uh, that never arose uh, uh, in North Vietnam, but uh, ba uh, bombing uh, mil uh, civilian targets would have come up, you know, and that sort of thing. So when I was pushed off that uh, position, of name, rank, service number, and date of birth, I made up those answers to the targets after Tet. And, uh, and so he bought it, he bought my answers. He bought my answers. Then he moved on to the next one and said, uh, he said, uh, then what, when are the B-52s going to come to Thailand? Because they were a devastating weapon and scared the daylights out of the ground troops. Uh, you couldn't hear a B-52 coming uh, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't uh, uh, see the bombs falling until they were on top of your head, and uh, they, just, it just plowed, they just plowed the terrain up something fierce, including the military targets that they were after. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the 11 days of Christmas when they bombed Hanoi is a perfect example of the devastation they could, that they could do. But up to that point, they weren't bombing Hanoi. But anyway, you want to know when the B-52s are coming, because it would have been a shorter flight from uh, Utapau, in the Gulf of Thailand to Hanoi and back, uh, then, uh, or North Vietnam and back, than it was from Guam to Hanoi or, or uh, the North Vietnam uh, area, north of the DMZ, and then back to Guam again. So uh, uh, that was an important question. So I, I just made up an answer. I said, six months from now. So he wrote it down. He wrote down six months. Uh, there's no way he could prove it. And there was no way I could prove it because I wasn't privy to all that information. Okay, and then uh, then he got on to uh, to other you know lesser important uh, military information that he wanted, and I, I I lied and I distorted and I I uh, I, uh, I twisted uh, uh, information so that it sounded credible, but uh, I didn't I didn't give him uh, any information because you know as a captain. Like I said, I broke the frags, but I didn't select the targets, and I wasn't in at SAC headquarters to know when the B-52s would move to uh, to Thailand. So uh, I was able to dance around that. Getting torture, it, we call it either the uh, bar and strap or the bar and and and, and ropes uh, treatment, and uh, that has to do with. Uh, uh, do you want me to demonstrate just sure. through here? That has to do with putting my arms with my wrists opposed behind my back uh, and fastened with uh, handcuffs. Now the handcuffs they used were those uh, uh, not flexible uh, handcuffs that are uh, connected with a chain like you see in the cop movies, uh, cops and robbers movies, but they are, uh, they were li they are like miniature stocks. They're, they're hinged on one end and they open up and you put your wrists in here and then they clamp it down and then they put a screw in there to keep it closed. Well, you don't, you don't fasten with your wrists in a normal uh, extended position. What you do is you turn the wrists behind and they're opposed, which puts additional stress on your, on your forearms and uh, your elbows. And then he, uh, he, what he did was he tied, uh, for me uh, on this occasion, uh, he used a strap about 12 feet long and uh, three quarters of an inch wide. Now, on later occasions, when I went through the same routine, they used a rope. But they took the strap and they tied it to the handcuffs between my wrists, and then they laced it, then they laced that strap back and forth 
between my forearm, my wrists and my forearms, all the way up past my elbows, up to my shoulders. And uh, as the guard was doing this, the guy we called, uh, I called him the monkey man because he was a very unattractive guy. Um, anyway, pushed me over on my side. So I have my legs extended out away from my body. My wrists and arms are behind me. I'm on my side. And each time he laced that strap, he placed his, they wore tennis shoes, uh, what we would call tennis shoes. They placed his tennis shoe on my my arms and pulled and pulled and pulled and laced it again and pulled and pulled and pulled until my arms are, uh, are virtually parallel to one another and touching, okay? And at the same time, the lacing goes in and out of your limbs, you're cutting off the circulation. Now, I was an athlete. I, I ran track and cross country and I played football, so physical exertion and the, the, the getting knocked around or the extending of your stamina through long distance running didn't bother me. I mean, that's one of the things, I, I was in good shape. But cutting off the circulation to your arms, your wrists, uh, the, 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 um, the handcuffs cutting in to your, 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 uh, the, not only the bones, but the, the nerves that, the, and the tendons in your wrists was very, very painful. And so when he had this lacing completed, then he took the running, what we call the running end, you know, the loose end of a strap, over my shoulder and pulled it down uh, uh, toward uh, my ankles, pushing down on my, my upper uh, body to get my nose to virtually touch the tile floor, okay? And then he, once he got me in that position, he wrapped the rest of the strap around my ankles and cinched it up, okay? And then these two guys, the interrogator and the monkey man, the, the, uh, the, the torturer, just got up and left the room. And while all of this is going on, the reflections in my mind are, how can one human being treat another human being with, with such brutality. To this day, I remember those thoughts going through my mind. And it, it, it's one of those bizarre things that when you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a very stressful situation, they come up, they come up. Like the idea sometimes you've heard where about the time people are, that look like they're gonna die, their entire life flashes before their eyes. Well, it wasn't my entire life, it was the moment. It was the moment that was causing me great pain and thinking, how in the world can one person treat another this way? And I'll tell you the bottom line, what the bottom line is. All the time I was in the Air Force and going through training for uh, survival and evasion, escape and all that sort of stuff, resistance, uh, avoiding um, uh, uh, giving sensitive military information, certainly propaganda, stuff like that. All of that, I was basing on the Geneva Convention on the Treatment of Prisoners of War that says you can't do that. So when I got shot down, I was flying, I was landing in an environment, a, a, a culture that didn't believe in that stuff. In fact, the North Vietnamese, like all the communist countries, took, a, took exception to what's known as Article 85, which, which says, we consider you to be a criminal subject to war crimes trials. You are not entitled to the, to the treatment under the rules of the Geneva Convention, okay, of 1949. So it came as a horrible shock to me that that was happening. So that's where that, how can one person treat another one that way? I had to, I had to over the years then become accustomed and talking to other POWs, tapping on the wall, I had to become accustomed to what the brutality was that was facing me. Because there weren't gonna, there, there, there wasn't gonna be a free lunch here. You know, there wasn't gonna be, uh, after we interrogate you, we're gonna put you in the big compound and you can, 
move around with uh, the rest of the POWs because they're really tough too and you were really tough and you resisted us, okay? They, don't, they didn't play that game. And they took a page out of the, uh, the playbook of the, of the Chinese communists uh, in, uh, in the Korean War. I mean, um, these, these people like worked hand in glove really in terms of philosophy on how to treat people. And so uh, when these guys got up and left, the pain started building, 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 building. Circulation was stopped. Uh, the throbbing became horrible. So I screamed and hollered and I said, okay, 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 I'll tell you. So when they came back in the room again, I, stag I untied me, I just staggered to my feet. And I swear to this day, first thing that came into my mind was, Fur, you're a wimp. You gave up too soon. I prided myself in being real tough. I, I, I was a John Wayne guy. I was a John Wayne guy. I always won, you know. I always, I always overcame the evil uh, that went, John Wayne overcame because goodness triumphs evil. And I said, "You quit. You gave up too soon. You disappointed yourself." So the eagle, he comes back in the room after they untie me. He sits down there, and the monkey man's sitting off, standing off to the side. He says, "Okay." And he asked me the, another sensitive question, a military question, which was classified. And I thought, oh, I bit my lip. I really I bit my lip. I said, I can't tell you that. Bingo, right back into the straps again. Same thing. Except this time, when the pain got great, and I, I uh, shouted, OK, I'll tell you. They didn't come back in right away. I, 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 I sensed that they were saying, we're gonna let that guy stew just a little bit longer so that he knows we're serious. So when they came back in again, after I hollered, then I started fabricating more and more and more uh, answers to their questions, uh, you know, dancing around things and making hypotheticals and all that sort of such that, and he wrote it all down. They, they write everything down. They have a dossier on every POW. And when they, when they left my room occasionally and I was, seated on this stool, they would go off, I know, and talk to my navigator and the, back, and the one guy in the back end that escaped, cross-checking what I told them with what they told them. Because when they came back, they would ask me a question which only the crew would, would know. Think, things like uh, what goes on in the squadron, activities and things like that, okay? Let me give you an example. The Ravens, uh, the back end guys, the electronic guys, they were a breed of their own. They had a sense of humor that was different than what pilots and navigators would have. So whenever the flight crew schedule came out, and it was written in grease pencil on the board, one of the crews in the back end would always have a fourth or third crew member written in Lieutenant Muggs. Well, if you remember, Lieutenant Muggs was old uh, Dave Garraway's pet chimp. Remember when he did, what was it, Today Show or whatever, Tonight Show, whatever it was. He always had this monkey that he was playing around with. That was Lieutenant Muggs, J. Fred Muggs. And so they always used to put him in there. Nobody knew who Muggs was, but the Ravens, they, they got a big chuckle out of it. The integrators came in in one of their exchanges between my two crew members and said, who is Lieutenant Muggs? And I thought, oh boy, they've been talking. He said, now I've got to make it. I said, well, I don't really know for sure. I had coffee with him one time at the officer's club, but I didn't know him much because he was one of those guys in the back end and they have their own world. They deal with their own business. So he wrote it down and then we moved on to something else. But when they go back and forth in the rooms like that, they're cross-checking stories and things like that to see. Uh, at radio frequencies and all that stuff, and uh, all that stuff. So you can't really make up too many radio frequencies uh, because they'll cross-check it with some of the other crew members. And that's one of the problems with, for instance, when John McCain got shot down, it was just John McCain that they had the source of information. For me, they had a source for me, however dubious it might be. Then they'll have the navigator, uh, who was injured also, like I was, and the uh, raven in the back end that survived. So, you know, they got three guys they can play against each other, so.
anyway, so that was that was in the first day uh, of my violent violent interrogation. After that, there were interrogations having to do with my own biography, which I fabricated, uh, family information, and uh, other propaganda, potentially propaganda, uh, useful information, stuff like that. You know. And that was the rest, and that was always the follow-on. Once they got you beat down, now they're going to take advantage of the propaganda aspect because we can get you, we can manipulate you now. So I had to fight that real hard. I really did. Yeah. As with every single POW in uh, North Vietnam that we knew about, either actually having cited another POW or got the name. It always came through the tapping on the wall. Communication was the, was the key to our survival and resistance, okay? And so when we got contact or we heard about somebody getting shot down, for instance, a POW who you would get in contact with who knew of another missing in action or pilot that was shot down would bring that information in. Not only would you have him, but you would have the names he brought with him that say, you know, Charlie from our squadron was hit by a surface air missile and he's being carried uh, missing in action or killed in action or something like that. So he'd bring that information in. You'd have his information. And we'd tap on the wall and we would memorize all of those names. Now the system I used, the system I used, and I had 300, at the end of the war I had 350 names that I had memorized. And I, I reviewed them every single day. I'd start out with the A's, then the B's, then the C's, then all the way to uh, the, the last one, Charlie Zuhowski. On the, you, you can't forget Charlie. So you'd never drop a name. You'd be, uh, if I was in a room with another POW or a couple of POWs, like when I started out, there were my first roommates after uh, 102 days was, was uh, uh, three other officers. And they said, we gotta start memorizing names. I'll give you the A's today. You memorize the A's, then the B's, the C's, the C's. And you'd, you'd pace back and forth in these cells, okay? And you'd start out with the A's and B's in your mind. And then you'd come across and say, uh-oh, I only have 220, at this point, say 220 names. I need 222. And then your, your cellmate might say, well, did you, uh, did you get all your A's? And you'd say, yeah, I got all my A's, because you know how many A's you had. You go B's, C's. And then he'd say, well, what about your, your uh, M's? He said, I only got so many M's. He says, no, he says, you've dropped one. It's, uh, give me your M's. And so between the two of us, or the three of us, whatever, you'd go through all the names, who, the last names that started with an M. Ah, that's it. More, more, that's the one, that's the one. And we knew them by service. And all those names were in our memory banks. A lot of them were killed in action, but they were names that we carried with us because we didn't want to have a situation like in, in Korea, in the Korean War where the communists would attempt to hold back POWs, not release them, okay, even though they wanted to be released. So we, we wanted to, when we got out, when we were debriefed in the intelligence debriefing, say, these are the names I memorized, and you'd go all the way down through there. Now, when the war got close to being ended, and we all moved into the big rooms, uh, then, we saw face to face most of the people we had on our list. So we could eliminate duplicates, you know. Now Smith might be S-M-I-T-H or S-M-Y-T-H. So we dropped the, uh, the, the S-M-Y-T-H because that was an English spelling. So we could, but it sounded, it sounded Smith, sounded the same, okay. So March of 71, after we had uh, established uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, communications, uh, throughout the camp, and we had the Sante raid. We had the Sante raid. We all moved back into uh, what we called Camp Unity, which was part of the greater complex of the Hanoi Hilton. It's actually a, 
on the other side of the wall in the same complex, okay? And now, when I, I had, so I had John McCain's name from tapping on the wall, okay? <clears throat> and then the uh, uh, actual visual of John took place in March of 71 when we went out to a place called Skid Row, which was, I'd say, about five to seven miles outside of Hanoi. And it was a very small camp, and there were 36 of us that moved out there. Uh, now, John, in his book, talks about the uh, bad actors, the tough nuts, being scooped up by the North Vietnamese authorities, camp authorities, put together and moved to Skid Row. Now, I'd be the first to, I'd be the first to admit I'm not the toughest guy in the world. What blessing was I due that I got thrown in with all these really great guys, tough resistors? Uh, there was McCain, and there was Bud Day, Medal of Honor winner, Leo Thorsness, who's, who was my cellmate initially at Skid Row, Medal of Honor winner. I had uh, naval officers, and then, of course, we had uh, uh, Air Force officers out there as well. Our, uh, Air Force Academy graduate two years Junior to me was another one of my first time cellmates out there at Skid Row. Then after a while, when uh, it started, when the flooding started in the Delta during the uh, uh, latter part of 71, uh, they moved us all back into what we called HBH, Heartbreak Hotel, okay? That was a bad, bad place. And they, used, they threw uh, five of us uh, or, or, or uh, uh, or more, or if there was a three-man cell they, or a two-man cell, they put four, twice the number, in some cells. So I have to sleep on the floor. And uh, the other guys would sleep in the two bunks, for instance. Or if it was just a solitary cell, one, one guy sleep on the bunk and the other two guys or whatever sleep on the floor. So they moved us there when the flooding took place in the Delta. Okay? After that was over, only 20 of us were selected to move back to Skid Row. John and Bud Day, Leo Thorsis, and me, and some other guys. Okay, uh, moved back out to Skid Row. So I stayed with uh, I stayed with John there, and we talked very frequently. Uh, we we call it hanging on the bars. We lived on the back side of this uh, this cell block, where the front side faced the courtyard, open windows, and on the back side we had open barred windows, and we'd talk down the way. It's where I learned a lot of things like uh, uh, the, an, uh, uh, the uh, address that uh, uh, was uh, uh, read at uh, John Kennedy's uh, inauguration, uh, and the, uh, 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 the poem If by uh, 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 Rudyard Kipling. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of different uh, invictus. We, we thrived on memory exercises of literature. And that's, I got, a, I got a lot of it from John. A historical perspective. Uh, some of the discussions were contentious. Guys had ideas about, you know, the origins of American democracy and whether or not, for instance, whether or not we were a Christian nation. That got a really big, big play on the backside of that, that was L block. These two guys uh, had got into a, a real, real discussion uh, not, they were in separate cells, so they couldn't throw fists. But, uh, you know, it was that sort of stuff, a real exchange. And uh, they try to shut us up. The Vietnamese always try to shut us up, keep them from, from, uh, uh, from communicating. But who pays attention, you know? We, we, we got away with it. And then when they walked to go to patrol the other side of the prison camp, uh, of the Skid Row, we'd start talking again, okay? And then they'd come back and they'd start talking. So, and you could always tap across the wall. Uh, you either longitudinally pass it on down the line, or just across the, to the cell behind you, where the where another guy was living. So we stayed there, probably uh, probably to the latter part of uh, uh, the latter part of seventy one, and then the twenty of us moved back into the same room. Uh, Bud Day was our, our senior ranking officer, and we moved back into uh, Camp Unity, and. Uh, I stayed on and off with, with John, uh, uh, you know, same room or adjacent rooms, whatever. Mostly the same room, uh, because we were we were we were both chaplains, in the room, and we were both on the communications team. Okay, uh, 
um, for instance, when you want to communicate with the senior ranking officers who lived across the courtyard from us, maybe about 75 yards away, you couldn't tap to them. They were in a separate building. So I used to climb up in those, uh, those big barred windows uh, in, the, in the room. And I showed you pictures of that. And I'd climb up there, and I'd put a black sock on my hand, and I would flash Morse code to Robbie Reisner, Robinson Reisner, uh, who was in solitary confinement on the other side of the camp. And I'd flash Morse code to him. And Robbie had a little flag he made, a homemade toilet paper flag on a piece of, of uh, bamboo. And he'd do two, two of them, yes, uh, uh, one no, and then he'd send messages back, policy things that would come up that he would get from other senior ranking officers in that saw block, also living alone. So he'd flash it to me, and I would, I would talk to the guy that's at my foot below the big window, because I'm about six or eight feet up, climb on his shoulders and get into the window. And then, you know, the window, uh, the window frame itself is whitewashed, so the black sock shows up nicely. And so I'd tell him what the message was from Robbie. And he would tell John McCain what the message was. And John, through the Morse code of you know A, B, C, et cetera, like that, we call it our mute code. It's not exactly a mute code, but it's something visual that we could use. And we would translate it or, or transmit it to the diagonal uh, uh, cell or a room, whatever it happened to be, uh, and because they could stand up and we could look over the top of the cell and see them. Now, one is some, something that's really humorous is that McCain's not very tall. He's not very tall. We had another guy that was at least six foot three who could stand, who could stand and just give the mute code. My guy below me would tell him, he'd just do this. John was so immersed in communications and so involved in uh, the uh, formal administration, you might say, or the command structure involved in it, because he was privy to stuff I didn't know about. Uh, I mean, through the mail, through packages, things like that. Anyway, he was so involved, he was intent on being the point man. So he would jump up and down trying to get the message. And Orson is our Marine friend, good friend of John's. He'd say, I'll take care of it. I'll take care. John ran off and got two of his blankets and borrowed probably somebody else's blanket and folded them up so that they were about that thick and raised him about a foot and a half, another 18 inches off of the bed pedestal, which we slept on so that he could be taller than Orson, and he could communicate. It was incredible. I thought, this is, this is it's hilarious. It's hilarious how, how he, he, he grasped on this, this, this need you know, to be involved in the command of this organization and contribute to it. And, and, and so he was the guy that uh, ultimately got the information from my footman, so to speak, and then he transmitted it to the other rooms. And that other room would use the, the uh, mute code to go to the other, another cell block uh, because it was sort of in a, in a, in a symmetrical uh, design at Unity where you could see by looking through these barred windows at the next one. Yeah. Communications, uh, you know, I guess the, the, the Latin word is the sine qua non of our existence. I mean, it was the reason. Now, I want to qualify it for myself. Because my entire life, uh, I was a guy that was perfectly comfortable doing activities and staying within myself. Long distance running is a one-man show, okay? Uh, the uh, building model airplanes, building model cars for competition and all that stuff, that's a one-man operation. So I was very comfortable growing up going down to our, our, what we call the shack at home, the barbecue shack, and making model airplanes, building model cars, 
reading. I was very comfortable with that. Now, that's not to say that I didn't fulfill an obligation in the military in the strategic sense of communicating, passing names, passing information, acting on the communications team, things like that. Because I did, it was very important. But like some guys, when they lived in solitary confinement, they were lost. They were lost. They were gregarious people. I wasn't a gregarious guy. You know, I was, I, like I say, I was comfortable that having activities, mental, I prayed a lot too, that's another thing. I had a really sincere, deep prayer life, excuse me, before I came, to, before I got shot down. So I was comfortable with that. But that's right, John is right, the communication was aimed at, at, at creating, developing, and sustaining the organization which was the resistance body. When Bud Day was our SRO, we came back, a senior ranking officer, when we came back from Skid Row, and we, the 20 of us were put in that one room, Bud says, hey, we need, we gotta have formalized uh, church services. Now that gets into an area where some guys might say, well, I was an atheist or I was agnostic or something like that. Nobody was forced. Nobody was forced every Sunday to attend church services, but we had church services. We had a guy that was in charge of the choir uh, and it would write the music from memory because they had a dance band at one time and he assembled a small choir to sing, okay? So Bud says, okay, we need, uh, we, we need chaplains. How about we break it up and we have for the four weeks of the month, we'll have a chaplain for every Sunday. So John, John was a, a chaplain. I always referred to him as the Reverend Pastor. He was the Reverend Pastor. That was our nickname back and forth. And he called me San Pedro. I was, home, I was from San Pedro, California, okay? It was an old naval port years and years ago and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, it was, it was kind of a catchword for him. So I was San Pedro and I was a chaplain. John was a chaplain. Then we had uh, two other guys. Um, the one I can think of is Jim Seahorn, uh, but, uh, uh, but I, I don't know who the fourth guy was. I can't remember. But John, again, in his humor, in his humor, and it'll come out the more you talk to him, in his humor, Seahorn, Jim Seahorn, he nicknamed, I was San Pedro. He was the reverend pastor. Jim Seahorn was Ocean Bugle. Ocean Bugle. <laughs> when I heard it, I thought, this guy's incredible. He can, he can tell a joke. He can tell a joke. It's like the one I told you about. Who's going to play him in the movie version of his biography? And, you know, he says, it's going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. And his kids say, no, 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 Danny DeVito. <laughs> it, he's, he's, he, and, he, and he laughed in the interview. You know, he's, he's chuckling and laughing. I think, I think the beauty about John is that, I really do, I think the depth of John is that, and it doesn't, it doesn't come out to people that don't really know him. He can laugh at himself. He can be humorous with his past life. He talks about uh, different things that happened to him that, uh, you know, not worth going into right now, but gives me uh, the understanding and the, the depth and the breadth of who John McCain really is. You know, the title of his book, I think, uh, that we talked about earlier, Worth Fighting For. I think, you know, that's a thesis. That's a thesis for John McCain. That's a thesis statement for John McCain. And I can give examples of what it, what it means to me in, in that sense, in a contemporary sense that I've observed in recent years that uh, others, I, I, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, others don't recognize. Others don't recognize. And um, I think... I believe that when he came back from his illness, his diagnosis, you remember he went straight to the floor of the Senate and he gave a speech. And in the speech, he, in, he encapsulated, he encapsulated what he told me is most important for a leader. Now we were talking about military at the time, but I always picked his brains for information because he, I was very impressed with him, very impressed. I mean, a guy that comes from a long lineage of American patriots, not, uh, 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 not uh, to the point where uh, you, don't, you, you don't remember that before his grandfather and his father, 
there was a long line, there were a long line of those associated with the McCain heritage uh, that contributed to this country. But what he told me when we had these talks, when we had these serious talks, and we'd walk around this perimeter of this room, I would ask him about leadership in the military in particular, but it goes to what I heard him say on the Senate floor, which uh, present company probably accepted, because you probably listened, you're doing a biography, a documentary of him, but probably what most other people did not see beneath the words that he spoke. And that is, he said, John, it's the mission and the men. Now, that's before we had females in combat. The mission and the men, okay? You don't exclude the men or those you lead, but you've got to keep uppermost in the mission. And that goes for the title of his book, Worth Fighting For, because he said, he told me, the most important thing for a leader to remember is that you must serve a cause greater than your, soul, your own self-interest. And in that speech on the floor of the Senate, that's what he was telling me. As I say, I think it was lost on most people because they were focused on the Obamacare thing and all, all the other peripheral health care things. But what he told me was, hey, John, I haven't changed. Nothing, nothing is different. I'm still serving a cause greater than my own self-interest. And he's taken a lot of gas. He has taken a lot of gas. But you have to get, I think, I think it's what I saw in prison and what I shared with him. You know, there's a, oh, that old expression, misery loves company. We had, a lot, we had a lot of misery, and I really loved his company because it was always a bright spot. His sense of humor. When we had entertainment nights on Friday and Saturday night, he'd talk about uh, great authors, great history. Uh, one of the favorites I used to like to listen to was uh, Mahan. He used to talk about sea power, uh, on uh, influence on history. He used to talk about E.B. Potter, who was uh, the, the great, uh, uh, and my other cellmates at the Naval Academy, who went to the Naval Academy, would talk about E.B. Potter, uh, who was uh, one of their history professors, a well-known well authority of history. All of these things he could share with me, and I, I took them all in. I took them all in. And uh, I think he, Bud Day and I uh, were sitting down one day, and uh, I told Bud, uh, I said, you know, I've been reading some of this because because of my eyes, I faked like I couldn't see very well because of the, the the slipstream hit me in the eyes, you know. And when the Vietnamese captured me, my eyes were black red. I mean, they were just black, and I faked bad eyesight because I didn't want to be forced to read propaganda over the radio or write propaganda. Okay, so I faked my blindness. So I would surreptitiously sneak in the corner of these cells of these rooms and I would read some of their propaganda pamphlets because they were interesting. They gave me some insight in what their mentality was like. And I told Bud Day one time, and I, I believe I shared it with John too. I said, you know, Pham Van Dong, Ho Chi Minh, and General Jap, the big three leaders of, uh, of North Vietnam, all underwent great trial. They all were, were, were persecuted by the French. A lot of times they went into exile. They went into guerrilla warfare. He says, but look what happened. They rose to the occasion where their time came, and they became the leaders of North Vietnam, communist North Vietnam. I said, I believe in this prison camp there are people that are going to do the same thing. They're going to do the same thing. Peterson became a congressman and then the first ambassador to North Vietnam, or to Vietnam. John did a, a tremendous work, beginning with his uh, naval uh, legislative work, and then his work in the, uh, in, in, in the Congress, both in the House and in the Senate. Sam Johnson in the House. Sam Johnson, I lived, the, Sam Johnson is the first POW I ever got in contact with. I was really beaten down. I was, they put me in a big room by myself. I hadn't, heard a, I hadn't heard a sound the whole time I was there. I didn't even know there's any more Americans there. 
Everything was quiet. It was deathly quiet. One night, and I'm pacing back and forth, and I, I, I measured the outside of this big room, and I walked a mile every day, and barefooted, because they didn't give me any sandals. And, and I heard these voices out the back, out this big window. I thought to myself, those sound like American voices. So I pushed a small chair, or a small table, up against the back wall, and there was one of those great big barred windows on the back wall. And I climbed up there, and the voices kept talking. I said, who's there? Who is that? And they all shut up, because underneath is where the guards patrolled. They had a path between the wall and the cell block. I said, who's there? And Sam comes back with a with a question. Says, "Who are you?" I says, "I'm John Fur." He said, "Were you shot down?" And I thought that's kind of a crazy question. I said, "Yes." When? Fourth of February. And then Sam comes back to me. I thought another crazy question. He says, "This year?" I said, "Yeah." Sam had got shot down in 1965. So he's trying to put this thing in perspective. There's the first guy he, he, that, that within a month or so he's ever talked to that, you know, just arrived. He said, do you know the code? And it was a tap code. And I had seen it on the table down in the interrogation room when I very first, I first showed up. And I just snapped at it. I says, ah, yes. He says, then get on the wall. So I went over the wall. I picked up my bar of soap and a rusty nail that I found on the floor because this place was dirty. I put my ear up against the wall, and he goes, dun da da dun 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 da da dun dun and then out the window, he says, that's shaving a haircut. If you understand and you can, talk, you can tap and communicate, go, two bits. So he says, let's try it. dun da da dun dun and I went back. Two bits, shaving a haircut, two bits. So I put my ear up against there. I have my bar of soap, and I have my nail. And he started very slowly tapping to me information. First question, besides biography stuff, shot down airplane, that's a first question after that. How did SMU do in football last year? Because he was an SMU graduate from Texas. And I, at that time, was following, U following USC when I was outside, because I went to USC for a few years, and the Air Force Academy. I didn't care about anybody else. And I thought, oh, how am I going to tell Sam I did, I did, I'm not interested in SMU, so I tapped back real slowly, I don't know, <laughs> which was an honest answer. So that's how we got checked. And then we go back to my original thesis that greatness is going to come out of some of those guys, Sam, John. But Day became a, a lawyer that fought on our behalf, and he pled cases before the Supreme Court. Not many people can do that. And then uh, we had Leo Thorsness, Medal of Honor, Bud Day, what Medal of Honor. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, Ed Peterson was the ambassador to, to Vietnam, the first one. He was a congressman from, uh, from Florida. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's true. Uh, the crucible, the, the Vietnamese used to say, the crucible of fire. Well, that's true. That's how you develop character. That's how you develop resilience, you know, stick to itiveness, which was my model airplane. Uh, 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 slogan, stick to it. Never quit building a model airplane, just put it aside. Finish it up and fly it. If it crashes, eh, so what? Buy another one and build another one. And so, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So, uh, indeed, uh, a lot of that. And you still saw Everett Alvarez became the deputy administrator of, the, of uh, Veterans Affairs. An attorney, great attorney. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of Good things came out of those experiences by these guys because they were very special people. I mean, here's a, for, for instance, Everett uh, and John for the same way. John, for his terrible physical condition uh, when he was captured, doggone near died. Uh, Alvarez, been there, uh, first guy shot down, been there since 1964. Never lost heart, never lost uh, his faith in his country or his fellow POWs. So, you know, my point being, the reason we see what John and others have done is because they have the resilience, the strength, the, the, the intestinal fortitude, if you want to call it that, the guts uh, to, uh, to, to survive adversity and to rise above it all.
and uh, uh, Robbie Reisner, General Reisner, uh, who was brutally, brutally, brutally tortured because he appeared on the cover of Time magazine during the airstrikes against North Vietnam. And my, one of my cellmates, one of my cellmates, I said my, one of my first cellmates, a naval officer said, uh, when, because uh, he had communicated with Reisner, he said uh, that Reisner told him when they were communicating, and the interrogator, when they found out who he was, say, ah, Reisner, we have been waiting for you. And you know, my ROTC instructor always said, before I went to the academy, don't get your face in the press at all. Name, picture, nothing. Because if combat comes in and you get captured, they're gonna exploit you. And they beat Reisner badly. They beat badly. But the one thing I remember that I carried away from that experience of, of talking to Reisner was that if you get beat down and you're suffering pain, deprivation, you're alone by yourself, bounce back and win the next round. And that was the story of his life in, in Hanoi, bounce back and win the next round. I did a little bit of, uh, of, of research on it after the fact, but uh, when I got shot down, uh, I didn't know anything about the tap code. But uh, some of the guys, I think Smitty Harris, uh, who came into the prison system, is the one who brought the tap code in. Um, and it's a five letter by five letter matrix, okay, and in the upper the upper left corner of this matrix is the letter A, and you go across the first row, uh, A, B, C, D, and then E. And then you go down uh, subsequent horizontal rows, beginning with F, L, Q, V, and ending with the last letter Z in the right lower corner of the last row of the last column. So. You have to, uh, in, the, in the alphabet that we use uh, in our language, we got 26 letters. So you have to, you have to drop out some uh, letter uh, such that you can have a five by five matrix and tap words or abbreviations of words when you want to communicate. So what we, dry, we dropped out was the letter uh, K. Okay, we dropped out the letter K. And then when I was in the interrogation room on my first day, and I looked at the, on the top of that table, I saw written in very precise letters, printing, all POWs learn this code. Didn't mean anything to me with that statement. Down below it, it had the five by five matrix of letters, as I described them to you. And off to the right, it had C equals K. Still didn't mean anything to me, okay? When I learned how to tap from Sam Johnson that first, uh, the first month or so I was there, what I learned was that a C and K are interchangeable depending on the context of the, of the message. Now, let me give you a funny story, which is true. When we had big shuffles uh, from one camp to another or within the camp, the Vietnamese loved to keep us off balance, keep us in the dark. So they shuffled POWs around. You might have a different cellmate or roommates uh, next month that you didn't have today, okay? And they shuffled around. Now, they usually kept the toughest guys isolated, okay? Now, when I came down and I started communicating and I let people know that I was faking my bad eyesight and for the reasons, I moved into one of these rooms that had, was a result of a shuffle. And I moved in with a naval officer, J.B. McCaney, rest his soul, he's passed away. But JB came in and said to me, he said, uh, this was at uh, the place we call the zoo, the zoo annex, 
as a separate part of the zoo itself. It was a brutal place. The annex, not so bad. But anyway, JB came into the room as our senior ranking officer, and he said, John, he said, how are your eyes? I said, they're fine. He said, I got a message when I was over in the zoo that, uh, that you were going blind. The message came over, fur faces blindness. I said, no. I said, remember, C is interchangeable with K. What the message said, fur fakes blindness. So we all had a great laugh. So the bottom line to my point is that you could abbreviate and you could, uh, you could uh, hyphenate and all that other stuff. And you learned to do that when you tapped on the wall. But you had to be careful on how you selected your letters, particularly if you had an interchange of C's and K's and things like that. And, uh, and so uh, with, the, with the 5 by 5 matrix, with the 5 by 5 matrix, uh, after I came home, I did a little research on it. And the origin of that, from what I can determine, is what they call the Polybius square. Now, Polybius wrote that same matrix, but he used Greek letters, okay? And it was uh, with, with the use of lanterns in the night, flashing lanterns in the night in a certain patterns that he could, or the people that used this code, could transmit the messages. Now, Kessler, if I'm pronouncing his right name right, Kessler, John mentions it in one of his books. Kessler wrote Darkness at Noon. Okay? It was about life in the gulag in the Soviet Union. And they used the same type of tapping matrix by banging on pipes that connected the various cells. And so it has a long, my point being, it has a long history of use by people incarcerated. So when Smitty Harris brought it in, he taught it to everybody, and whoever was in that interrogation room before me wrote it on the table. All POWs learned this. Could it very well could have been Smitty? I don't know, but all the people that came through came through that room and were tortured, and he brought that in and then wrote it down on, or somebody brought it and wrote it on that table. So that's how I filed it away in my mind. Now something you need to remember too. When you're in an isolated condition, you're living in solitary confinement or you're in a small room, everything matters. Sometimes the antagonisms can grow out of proportion and you argue with guys or you have uh, disagreements, and, but you always come back to a congenial level together and get along because you can't exist in a small room in solitary or in, uh, in, 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 in small confinements in an unhappy state, because you're all there for a particular reason, and that is to resist exploitation by the Vietnamese communists, North Vietnamese communists, okay? So when you, when you, uh, when you communicate, you've got to be open to passing messages, and you've got to uh, relay, and you use a common wall. Uh, you're, I don't know whether you're familiar. If you put your ear up to uh, that wall behind you there, uh, and somebody is down there near the door, on the same common wall, you can tap a message and that'll be picked up by that person down there. Uh, and if you go on the inner wall of this room here, tap to somebody down there, if it's a connecting uh, uh, surface between the two of you, you can, you can hear the messages that way. And so we use the tap code, first of all, to communicate with the five by five, and it, it has a long history. Um, you can also use the same basic five by five matrix. And all of this is a picture in your mind. All of these letters are pictured. And you remember, the way you remember it is, when you're tapping on the wall or you're communicating with that code, AFLQV, AFLQV, while you're tapping, AFLQV, while you're listening, AFLQV, because AFLQV is the first letter of every horizontal uh, uh, row, okay? So you know, after A is B, C, D, and, and E is the end of it. But you picture all of this stuff in your mind, but you keep your framework alive by remembering AFLQV, AFLQV. Okay, and of course Z is, is the last one right in the corner. Now, what you can also do is use a broom 
and sometimes POWs were taken out of their cell to wash or sweep the sidewalk. And they would take these old bamboo brooms. They're made out of bamboo slivers and bound together. Very old, uh, ancient variety of broom. And you would sweep, 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 sweep. And you'd send messages. That way, you didn't have to worry about tapping on the wall to a restricted audience. You could type, you can tap it through the whole, or sweep it through the whole camp. And I'll tell you, in that, in that camp, things were so quiet, so quiet, because communication was severely punished, so people did it surreptitiously. Uh, I moved into a place called the Snake Pit. I was in solitary confinement again. And why they put me in the Snake Pit between two of the hardest core resistors, I'll never know. They usually put you with people who were a little soft in the resistance uh, regime, and hoping that they would drag you down just a little bit, cause you to lose faith or whatever, okay? Make you easy to get along with. The hardcore guys, they kept separated. So when I moved into the snake pit, or the mint, as we called it, you know, all the, all the uh, cell blocks uh, in uh, the Hanoi Hilton were named after casinos in Las Vegas. I don't know whether you, are aware, you knew that, okay. So this was the mint. But some people called it the snake pit because it was way isolated from everybody else. You walked into a separate room, which was totally isolated. And then in that room, there were three parallel solitary confinement cells. Very, very small, smaller than other solitary confinement cells. And on my right was Jeremiah Denton. And on my left was Jim Mulligan. And I used to say, we got, two, we got three Catholics in a row here. These guys, these Vietnamese can't survive this. They'll never survive this. We, we got them where we want them. And those two guys were very, very hard line, tough resistors. Jerry shot down 65. Jim Mulligan shot down to 67 before I was. And they were communicators. I mean, they were communicating. They'd been tortured and beaten and abused for communicating, you know, for years. And they put me between the two of them. Well, they weren't going to soften me up because I got two of the toughest guys in the world. So we got along famously. And one of the ways we communicated was we'd talk under the door where there was a crack, okay, between the floor, the concrete floor, and the door. And so my job, mainly because I was a junior captain, I guess, I don't know, two Navy guys, they're, they're rank conscious. Anyway, I would look to see if I could see a shadow under the crack of the door out near where a guard would try to come into the cell block and catch us communicating, because they love to catch you communicating, because that meant they throw you in leg irons or even worse, okay? So I used to I used to clear, but I could also communicate. And those two guys would talk to one another from the outer two cells, and we'd communicate that way. And then, of course, if I saw a shadow coming, I'd go boom, boom, you know, one great big boom on the side of the wall, and that's he shut up. And then Jerry would, uh, and Jim, tap on to each other on the common wall at the end of at the end of our cells so they have a common wall and the cells were perpendicular and so they could communicate and if I wanted to listen to them I could put my ear up there and I could hear what they were saying as well and uh, they could uh, communicate down the whole length of the wall which was the outside wall conduct conducting all of the rooms and you knew who was in that room because you'd get you tap and you get the lineup. So and so's in this room, so and so's in that room. And as long as you had a common wall, you could send a message a long way. And you could use a nail. Your, sometimes your knuckle would get really raw from tapping on there. And that's what most guys used. But if you, if you had a nail or a uh, piece of wood, a hard piece of wood, you could tap on that wall and it would carry further because it would, it would echo further down that wall. And the wall was only about a, a, a brick width in thickness, so you could communicate that way. But, that, but the basis of all of that stuff was the five-by-five five matrix of uh, the Polybius Code, I call it. And, uh, and Smitty Harris brought it in, and uh, uh, you, did, you, couldn't, you didn't want to drop notes. You, that's the obvious. Uh, they, knew, uh, they knew where uh, you would drop a note. They could check the cracks in any place that you went, say, to clean the waste bucket. 
okay, you would, wouldn't want to leave a note in a place that was obvious so the guards had come through. They always checked it. Guards always checked wherever they put POWs before, for instance, to, wa to, uh, to wash dishes or to uh, uh, empty waste buckets. They'd always check it first to see if there was any communication uh, evidence, and then you'd go in and do your stuff, and then when you left, they'd check again. It was an example. When I was in that great big room and I heard Sam talk and I established communication, uh, after I'd been there about, uh, oh, probably uh, four weeks, they took me out for my first shave. And that's when I got a good idea of what my eyes looked like because they gave me a piece of broken mirror and, uh, and a sliver of soap. It was about, it wasn't even as good as ivory soap. And you know how crummy ivory soap is. It's, it's not like Dove or it's not like uh, all these other exotic soaps. But anyway, it was a piece of white soap. And I'm supposed to sh lather up with this thing. And I walk into this stall that's just about directly across from this room I'm living in and where Sam's living and the rest of the guys, Smitty Harris. Uh, I walk into the stall. It's narrow. And at the end, there's a, a concrete sink and it's filled with water. The guards already filled it, a spigot. He filled it up with water. He told me to bring my, my drinking cup, which is about 16 ounces. Okay, you've seen that, it's a green, green, you may have seen that, it's a green cup. I've got a picture of it, I'll show it to you later, but uh, in that packet there. But anyway, uh, it was a gift from the, from the North Koreans. It's one of those solidari uh, solidarity type messages, you know, against the uh, imperialist Americans and all that routine, whatever it is, but anyway, uh, so I went into the cell, and I hacked through my beard. I mean, this time it's, it's big. Hacked through it, and I cut myself, and this, that, and that. I said, boy, there's no, there's no way to lead a life, you know, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. And, and as far as I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to bathe. Well, with a 16-ounce cup, I'm going to dip it and pour it. You know, I did as best I could. I rinsed off a little bit and that sort of thing, my feet. And then I got a bright idea. I said, you know, I haven't had contact with any of my crew members. I wonder if they're here. I said, the best way I can do that is I'll leave a message. So on the floor, just like everything else, there's dirty, there's a piece of brick, red brick. So I took my red brick, piece of red brick. I wasn't even uh, uh, stealthy about this whole thing. I went over to the wall and I wrote mugs, M-U-G-G-S, mugs meeting J. Fred Muggs. I said, ah, if there's a, if my navigator's here or if that electronic warfare officer is here, Muggs was always on their flight crew, you know, uh, uh, fictitious. They'll know Fur's here or maybe whoever else got shot down is here because we came from the, the same environment there, you know. So I wrote it on there. Guard comes, opens the rickety old wooden door, it takes me back to my big room where I'm living. I hadn't been, I just put my stuff down, I hadn't been there five minutes. And he comes back and he swings open one of the big wooden doors. He goes like this, and he says, put on your long sleeve clothes. These are my Sunday go to meet and stuff, you know, the long magenta striped purple uh, uh, trousers and, and shirt. And he takes me over for an interview with the guy we call the Soft Soap Fairy. Uh, Soft Soap Fairy is extremely effeminate, chain smoker. Uh, he could be very mean, but uh, but they took me over and they said, Foot! My name was Foot because uh, you can't translate fur into a Vietnamese word. So they made up a name for me, F-O-T. And there's a little carrot on the top, like a tent over the O, foot, okay? Now, a friend of mine, Barry Bridger, Barry Bridger, had a Vietnamese name, cow, because cow in Vietnamese means bridge, okay? So his was a trans, it's just transliterated, okay? Mine could, so foot. So the ferry brings me in there, and I'm standing there, he says, foot, he said, uh -huh. You were communicating. I said, what? You were communicating. With whom were you communicating? I said, I, I, I don't understand. You wrote mugs on the wall. I said, oh, and I explained 
who J. Fred Muggs was, and that in my childhood, I sort of slipped it a little bit. I said, in my childhood, we all used to watch the East Side Kids with Leo Gorsi and Hunts Hall and all those guys, uh, the Bowery Boys. Okay, we used to watch it, and uh, Leo Gorsi's name was Muggsy McGinnis. I said, so, so we used to call each other, hey, you Muggsy, hey, Muggs, Muggs. So I write that, I said, it's like Kilroy, I said, it's just like Kilroy was here. I didn't use the word of it, but an explanation, like Kilroy was here in the Second World War. You'd write it everywhere. I said, I write mugs all the time. We call each other mugs. So the fairy looked at me and he said, mm, okay. So I went back to my cell, nothing happened. Nothing happened. I don't know whether because I was a new guy or whether the explanation was adequate or whatever. But my, I go back to my original lesson in pointing out that when, before I went into the shower stall, the guard looked at everything. He looked at the walls, and as now as I remember, they were clean. I mean, there were no marks on it or anything like that. I went in and no old, old smart aleck fur, you know, he's gonna communicate with his crew members. He writes mugs on there and he goes back to his room. The guard comes back in again and he, he, and he goes in and he says, hey, soft soap fairy. He says, fur wrote, a communications note on the wall. And of course, you know, that's what it was, in, in, uh, you know, surreptitiously. So that's how I gave him that explanation. He bought off on it. But I learned that if you're going to communicate, don't use note drops and uh, don't write on the wall or the floor or anything like that, like you're going to leave a mess. And don't, uh, guys at first, when they got shot down, they would scratch something on the underside of the plates or the waste bucket under the lid of the waste bucket or under the bottom of the waste bucket, which is about that tall, you know, and that sort of thing, try to send a message. Uh, there's a story that, um, I don't know if you want to include this, but there's a story that uh, somebody sent out a message, uh, a shoemaker, I think, said uh, uh, one time he scribbled on the waste bucket, welcome to the Hanoi Hilton. And some seem, seem to think that's how Hoa Lo, which is the Vietnamese name for that, that prison, got its name, Hanoi Hilton, he, uh, that uh, uh, Bob Shoemaker made it up. Yeah. But anyway, anyway, so long story short. Probably uh, Skid Row, Skid Row has average days, but they were always, um, they were always kind of, uh, days that were short on much activity in the sense uh, that you got out and, 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 and mixed with other POWs. Uh, ours was mostly talking out the, the cells through the bars to the guys down the, down the way, okay? Because right in front of us, there was a wall. It was a wall separating the camp from, I, th I thought, I think it was a big manor house or something like that. I could see the, uh, a, uh, crest on this building, but you could just only get a little bit of it, so you can't tell. But a typical day would have been when we moved back from there to what we call Camp Unity. And, 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 and you know, if there's, any, if there's any sort of beauty, uh, any sort of uh, 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 enhancement to uh, existence and a relationship among the people that live within it, uh, it would have been when the 20 of us moved back in the same room, John, uh, Leo Thorstness, myself, Bud Day, uh, I think um, uh, uh, the late Moon Mullen was in there, naval officer. Uh, we all moved in there together, and that seemed to be um, a, uh, uh, that seemed to gel our relationships, I think. It, it certainly did with, with John for, for me. Um, and from this standpoint, the senior rank, Bud Day, senior ranking officer established a military organization of a command structure at the top, okay, and then his staff positions would be the morale, welfare, and recreation officer, uh, the uh, health and hygiene officer, or something like that, the uh, supply officer. Now, McCain, uh, now I don't remember, I don't remember uh, if he had anything to do other than the 
chaplaincy. He was a chaplain and also in charge of uh, entertainment uh, as part of the morale, welfare, and entertainment, okay? Uh, and recreation, I mean. He was entertainment. And Fridays and Saturdays, so, no, so Monday through Thursdays, generally, were academic days. I mean, we had, we had, and the beauty of it is that we had experts in every single field you could name. I mean, Nils Tanner uh, was an automotive expert, okay? He could teach you how to rebuild an engine. Uh, uh, Jack Rollins, a naval officer, he used to be a meat cutter. And so he'd take the big sheets of toilet paper before we tore them up and made them useful as toilet paper, and he'd fix them on the wall. He'd hang them on the wall, and he'd, with homemade ink, which was, you probably familiar, homemade ink is uh, cigarette ashes and uh, water. And if we had some sugar available, we'd mix sugar in there for a binder. And he'd draw pictures of cows, pigs, the livestock that you would slaughter. And then he'd cut the, he'd draw the, the various cuts of the meat. He'd give a class like that. Niels would do what my old instructor at the Air Force Academy, believe it or not, talk about small world, was the aeronautics and uh, aerodynamics instructor at the Air Force Academy. So he would, he would teach uh, lessons in aero and stuff like that. Okay, John, getting back to John, uh, John would teach literature and he'd tell movies and also uh, occasionally geography too. And I would tell movies. We all had our favorites. Mine were always, uh, uh, my favorites were always the John Wayne movies. So I would talk about John Wayne movies. But, but John had a vast, uh, had vast, a vast scope of uh, knowledge in that uh, he'd talk about movies that were, were classics, built on classic uh, novels. He'd talk about uh, some of the, uh, uh, he talked about Ring Lardner. He talked about um, uh, who's uh, 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 another uh, a Broadway writer. He uh, uh, can't think of guys. And, he wrote Guys and Dolls. Uh, but anyway, he'd he'd tell these these various these various stories about uh, about history, about entertainment, and and things like that. And uh, uh, the church services uh, were the Sunday were the Sunday. Uh, 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 efforts on his part, and he'd he'd write a he'd write a homily, he'd uh, uh, he'd, uh, he'd he'd have scripture, and I would do the same. And and as a, as, a, as an example, what I would do, uh, I'm, I'm being Catholic, and back in those days, we didn't read we didn't read the Bible as avidly and as as much as uh, the uh, the Baptists did. So. Jim Seahorn, old Ocean Bugle, the other chaplain, was Baptist. And so what I would do, and I remember, I remember when very vividly, my, my Easter Sunday, 1972 homily was about the resurrection. And one day, one day, God, in his good time, will roll away the stone in front of our burial here as POWs, and we'll go home. We'll be resurrected. And I remember that very well, because I patterned it on there. But I said, I said, Seahorn, I said, Jim, I said, I need, I can give the homily, it's no problem, but I need some scriptural readings. Give me an, give me an Old Testament reading, and I want a New Testament reading, too. Can, can, you, can you remember any of that? And by gosh, he sure did. I copied it all down. He dictated it. I copied it down. So I used my toilet paper with my homemade ink on it and all that. And I read the scripture, and then I gave my my homily on uh, on the uh, on the resurrection, and how you know one day we're going to rejoice about our own resurrection. But but John's John's were probably better planned than mine were. Probably uh, uh, I think uh, deeper in a in a theological sense. I think he, he had a good grasp, but he had a good mind. He's got a good mind, uh, and he was able to he was able to draw parallels and things like that in the cell. First of all, Vietnam it was a big propaganda day for the Vietnamese. We had our special meal on Christmas. You get a leg and a, th a leg and a turkey thigh, a leg and a turkey thigh. You get a a, a salad of 
carrots and some greens, a half of a beer, a Vietnamese beer, and uh, you get some hard, hard candy. Um, and there was a, something else on the plate. I don't know whether it was uh, potatoes or w what it was. But anyway, you'd get their special meal. That was their propaganda thing. And um, what we, we'd, we would have a secret Santa. We'd, we'd draw names. We'd draw names. And uh, we uh, would then uh, create a gift. We create a gift of something. It didn't have to be tangible, but it could be an expression of something due when we were all released and then I would give to you or I'd make available to you. Could be one of the guys could say, you know, I'm going to cook you a homemade uh, Italian meal, you know, if, if that was your, your choice. And you would do that. And so we take the names and we draw the names out of a hat. And uh, then we would, uh, we, we would give the gift or we would announce to that person whose name we had what, what the gift was. Now, I became, I became known as a cake baker. And what you did was um, save up the instant Kool-Aid that some of the guys got in package. Incidentally, I never got a package the whole time I was there. Uh, because I think the reason was I refused to sign a propaganda statement saying back in 68 when, it, when the peace talks were just starting to germinate uh, that due to the lenient and humane treatment of the Vietnam people, I am allowed to receive this package. Well, Hayden Lockhart and I went out there individually when we were confronted with that receipt and, said, and we just gave him the finger on it. I said, forget it. I'm not, I'm not writing a propaganda receipt for you after all the misery that you've put me through here. It's not worth it. So they took the package back. I never saw it, actually. I've got the wrapper downstairs, incidentally, because it came back to my dad. And he kept sending packages, but I never got any of them. And, I, and, and the same thing for mail. I only got four letters the whole time I was there, and that was in the mid middle of 1970, okay? So a lot of other people were treated the same way, you know, uh, betwixt and between. But anyway, when in the packages, some people would get instant Kool-Aid. So being the cake baker, I would ask them if I could have that instant Kool-Aid, okay? Uh, and I would take the bread, I would take the bread that we got for a certain meal and anticipating when the celebration would be, I would take the insides out of the bread, the dough, add water to it, and then I would knead it together and it'd be like cake dough, okay? And lay it out on a piece of clean, I would say toilet paper, but it's you know as good as we could get, paper. Lay it out, and then I would take and add, uh, if it was gonna be a colored dough, then add a colored uh, bit of, of, uh, of Kool-Aid, and knead it in there, and then smooth it out, and smooth it out, make a homemade candle, and stick it in there, be a piece of bamboo or something like that, if it was a, if, if it was a birthday or something like that. And uh, toward the end, when we were getting some sugar in the room with the Kool-Aid, I would mix that up with a little bit of, of water and smear that on the top and make a frosting out of it. And so we'd, then we'd cut it up, you know, and we'd celebrate it. At Christmas time, I'd decorate it with uh, something, maybe a little patch of green, if we had uh, green uh, Kool-Aid, uh, something like that, you know, to, uh, 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 holly leaves or something like that, red if you had, uh, but you'd, so you'd squirrel away all this stuff. You'd save it for a rainy day. And to make it sweet, to make it sweet, we received saccharin tablets if you didn't have sugar. We had saccharin tablets, you'd, you know, you'd uh, dissolve those in water and you could mix that in with the bread dough. But it, it was all from homemade ingredients. There was a time when he was, uh, when he played uh, Scrooge during that, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, uh, A Christmas Carol. But one, one season, one season, we, amongst ourselves, we put on a Christmas carol, and John was, uh, was uh, Scrooge. And uh, uh, 
I was Bob Cratchit. Tiny Tim was the big, tall Marine guy, Orson Swindle, I told you about. Anyway, we went through this whole thing of, uh, of uh, the Christmas. I think we focused on Christmas future. And uh, uh, Jackie Fellows was uh, Tiny Tim. And he, he took all his clothes off and just put a diaper on. So he was Tiny Tim. He has since passed away. But uh, Fellows was Tiny Tim. And uh, 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 John had uh, pork chop, uh, pork chop uh, uh, whiskers, and I think we had I think we had some cotton available, but anyway, um, he played Scrooge, and and uh, and uh, we come on the graveyard scene. We come on the graveyard scene, where Christmas past. Our Christmas future is bringing John and showing him what the future's like. And of course, John has got his bad leg and he's hobbling along and hobbling along. And um, he climbs up on the, on the pedestal that we slept on so everybody could see it had to be raised up because the only, only place that we could perform this thing. And uh, for the gravestone, for the gravestone, we had one of the waste buckets, okay? And uh, the lid was on it, as I recall. And um, Christmas Future says, uh, Scrooge, this is what's going to happen to you. This is what's going to happen to you. I want you to take that lid. I want you to take that lid and tell me, what does it say? And he says, Bo, <laughs> instead of Scrooge. Bo meaning bucket shit bucket, and uh, everybody just cracked up and laughed and all that, and of course McCain thought that was that was hilarious, but uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a, he, he had a, a sense of humor in that sense that he never got, you know, I don't think I ever saw him morose in the whole time I was there. You know, when we were at Skid Row was the time I would see him talk, I would see hear him talk back. Uh, I, I don't, in my mind, I don't, I don't think there was a wrong, a long running uh, diatribe between him and the guards that I observed at Skid Row. Now, some of the times I was on the, on the other side of the cell block, so I didn't know what was going on. Uh, where he was, so it could have been that he was giving him a ration of crap. I don't, I don't know, but I know, I know when the guard came down, and said, "No talk, no talk, no talk." John would give him a four-letter word or something like that, you know, to scare him off. You know, f off. You know, you know, get out of, get, you know, I'm going to talk. I don't care how loud it sounds to you. I'm going to talk. I'm going to, I'm going to communicate, and uh, it was that sort of thing. But I don't remember. I don't remember a long-running, uh, angry diatribe that that he kept up uh, with the guards. I'd see occasionally I can remember some of it, but not. In other words, I I think I think he was. I for, for, to me, I think he was a good example. I think he was a good example of of a naval officer, American, doing uh, doing what was expected of him. And uh, he'd get he'd get he'd get pushed into a corner, and his fuse might be a little short some days for whatever reason. We all had good days and bad days, and he would lash out something like that. But I don't, but I don't think uh, I, I don't think I recall just a long running uh, feud. Uh, you know, uh, during the time I lived I lived with him at Skid Row. Now. When we went into the big rooms, uh, he was not the senior ranking officer, and he didn't deal much directly because we were not supposed to break the chain of command. He didn't deal so so directly with the, the interrogators or or the guards. Um, he might have come to head to head with the uh, interrogators when he was called out for a, what we call a quiz, something like that. But and none of us ever knew what went on in the quiz room, except that the the person probably behaved 
honest, honestly and, and, and honorably. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it didn't spill the beans and our secrets and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, but what he told them and how angry he was in the quiz room was something I, I wasn't a witness to. Hanoi Hannah was a nickname that, uh, and I don't remember who, but somebody gave to the female broadcaster, something akin to Tokyo Rose or Axis Sally in the Second World War. But there were actually, there were actually three commentators on the radio. Uh, uh, one was Tulun, I remember this name. The other was Chi Mai. And then there was some guy we nicknamed Captain Queer, okay, because he had an exceptionally effeminate uh, uh, sounding to, to his voice. And the women always dominated him, Tulun and Chi Mai. Uh, <laughs> I don't know with Rochelle's here, I had to talk about the derogatory. Uh, you could put paper in your ears if you want to, but. I thought it was funny. One of the guys, I don't, and, and I'm not sure it was John, but he said, did you hear, did you hear about the wedding that took place uh, among the, the broadcasters? Fan Van Dong, you know, was, uh, he's, he was the prime minister, or the premier, premier Fan Van Dong. He was just below, uh, Ho Chi Minh. Pham Van Dong married Chi Mai. Did you hear about that? No, no, no. Yeah, and they had a child called Chu Mai Dong. <laughs> it could have been John, I don't know. But when I heard it, I just, I fell, I fell on my side just aching laughing. Just, just, but you see, my, my whole point in mentioning it is that guys never lost their sense of humor. They never lied. And the, the, the Christmas Carol was another example, you know, with John, Bo. And, and I forgot to say, uh, uh, Christmas, Christmas Future says, McCain, and he, he didn't call him Scrooge, he says, McCain, you fuck. what does it say in that, that bucket or that gravestone? And he says, Bo? And that's a, that was the funny part. So, you know, the, the speakers boxes, the speakers themselves were only about five inches or six inches in diameter. And uh, the sound sometimes was not really good. And uh, lots of times it would be static, but most of the time you could hear them. And they were in a little box. And uh, they would come on at six o'clock in the morning and a rebroadcast of the same thing at eight o'clock at night. And they were, uh, the, the propaganda broadcasts on the Voice of Vietnam, that's what this was, Voice of Vietnam, were aimed at the troops down south mostly, the Americans down south, to discourage them, to uh, uh, shame them into, with anti-Americanism at home, things like that, and a war demonstrations to quit fighting against the fraternal Vietnamese people, so to speak. Now, when these broadcasts would come up, at, and, you, and, and we would listen at 8 o'clock, even though it was a rebroadcast, as well as 6 o'clock in the morning, because maybe we missed something in the first broadcast. M maybe uh, it was too noisy in the room, or we, we didn't think we heard what we heard. And so we'd always, uh, we'd always listen at, uh, at 8 o'clock as well. Well, whichever broadcasts they were, um, John McCain would always listen to them because, this, because he, was a student, he was a student of current events, a student of the war, a student of how the war was going from the propaganda viewpoint. And when you listen to these broadcasts, Eight out of 10 times, so to speak, you'd pick up a tidbit that would give you an idea of what the truth really was. Now, 
is an example. Not too long after Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the Vietnamese made some on The Voice of Vietnam, some backhanded comment about uh, America um, uh, may, may be able to land a man on the moon, but they'll never be able to defeat the Vietnamese people in, in this war, that sort of thing. So you picked up that, if you were listening carefully, you picked it up. So, so because of these little tidbits that would often uh, come up, John, John would listen, he would listen to both broadcasts. And when he went up in the, near, in the neighborhood of the speaker, which was always way out of arm's length or arm's reach, you couldn't touch it to tear it down or out of anger, you know, because it's propaganda. It was always up out of arm's reach near the, near the, the ceiling. Uh, John would walk down in front of the speaker and he would cup his ears with his hands so that they acted like uh, amplifiers. So when the sound came in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be dispersed by any peripheral noises or things like that. And he put his hands like this. And he did that for, for every broadcast. He listened and he listened and he listened. And he'd always find something there that helped you know, clarify a point or explain something or give him an idea so he could think about it and understand what was really taking place. Because if you did that, you could, you could figure it out. Let me give you something. When I was living in the zoo, the Tet on the, on the 31st of January, I think, of 1968, the, the, the Tet Offensive was launched by the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And right off the top, they claimed these thousands and thousands and thousands of casualties that they caused for the South Vietnamese soldiers and the American soldiers and this and that, and they, they've destroyed this many uh, pieces of military equipment. They've, they've, they've devastated these strong points. Um, above all, they've caused all of these casualties. And I looked over at my cellmates in, in this room when we were living in, in which we were living. And I said, you know, that offensive is a failure. They have failed. The same thing, because I'm a, I'm a student of Chinese history. I find it fascinating. I said the same claims were made by Chiang Kai-shek when he was getting the stuffings kicked out of him by Mao Zedong and being driven to Taiwan. The same thing. So you're going to see, as the days go on, you're going to see a revelation that the Tet Offensive was a failure and that they suffered. They suffered more than we did. Well, we didn't learn the full extent of it until we came home, but that's exactly what happened. When I went through uh, last year, 2016, in March last year, I went to the Citadel, part of my, my, my visit with the GIs from... Uh, the down south war that came on the trip with us. Uh, part of it was to visit the, the ancient city of Hui, and one of the Marines that was in the Battle of Hui took us to the bridge, and he showed us exactly what happened and how they repulsed the, the uh, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong attacks. And then we went into the citadel, and I saw how difficult it was to, um, to get them out of the citadel. Uh, the communists out of the citadel. And I asked the question, I said, why didn't, you, uh, why didn't you bring in air power? You could have selectively used air power. They said, oh, no. It's, it's the, the guide says it was too politically sensitive because this was the ancient citadel, the ancient capital of Vietnam. I said, well, you, you underwent an awful lot of casualties because you didn't bring in you know, air to ground cover and, and strafe and do that, not bomb, but you know, take out the targets. But anyway, so when that announcement was made about the Tet Offensive, uh, I heard it on the radio, and I told my son, I said, hey, that thing was a failure. Read between the lines. And if you look at Chinese history, and I told them that, the same thing was made by the nationalists against Mao Zedong, and they lost. They lost the same, you're going to find the same. And indeed, indeed, the Tet Offensive was a failure. It was a failure. And, and we survived the Quezon, too, which was about that same, that same time.
average meal, average meal was, uh, you mean the one with the rat in it or the one without the rat, the soup? Anyway, a little girl, little girl, who did, the women did all the heavy lifting up there. The little girl came in, she'd have uh, two buckets, two buckets of soup. It could, be, it could be potato soup, it could be, and now this is seasonal, okay, this is seasonal. So it could be potato soup, depending, say, in the winter time. It could be uh, 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 pumpkin soup. Uh, it could be what we call sewer greens, which is just like going out here and mowing, a gra mowing the grass, and then you throw it in a big pot and you cook the daylights out of it, and you serve it up, throw a handful of salt in there. And, and it, 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 some guys call them bitter greens. I call them sewer greens. Uh, I love potato soup because I'd mash it all up, and, and then I'd take my rice and I'd throw my rice in there, and, um, or bread and throw it in there, and so I just love to do that. I believe in the one-plate meal, anyway, because my father used to tell us it all goes at the same place anyway. But, uh, or uh, if you have a pumpkin soup, they'd take a machete and take their pumpkins, and they just, they just hack them into chunks, skins and all, just pumpkin. And they, they'd never put the stem in there, but they'd throw the rest of it, put a big pot and boil the daylights out of it. And it always came out watery, but so what? Uh, you know, I was raised in a family, this is a key. I was raised in a family that I had a mother and father uh, who uh, were raised or reared in uh, the Depression, the Great Depression. And so when I sat down to eat a meal, which was always built from scratch, my mom, we, we never went out to eat dinner, ever. Uh, she, would, uh, she would cook from scratch, she would bake from scratch, and uh, if there was anything left over, she'd put it in the refrigerator and we'd have it for the next few meals. But at that meal, I would finish every single morsel of food on my plate. We weren't, my dad would not let us get up from the table without, my, my brother hated peas, okay? He never left till that last pea was, was gone. But I loved everything, I, I ate everything. And when I got to Vietnam, I loved everything. N nothing was abhorrent to me, nothing. Uh, the, the dried sardine-sized fish was very salty, not very tasty, I don't care, it's food. You know, you know, consume food for the for the health of your body, and uh, and and don't throw anything away. And so, so that's the way I looked at it. So you had pumpkin soup at the zoo. You had pumpkin soup. You had potato soup, or you had sewer greens, and you could have uh, bread sometimes. You could have bread sometimes. Uh, most of the time, it was rice, and then you'd have a side dish, a side dish maybe of fried bananas little monkey bananas, they're really delicious when they're fresh, sweet, very sweet, they're better than the ones we buy in our store here. But uh, they're, 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 they're short and they're fat and they're very good, but they would take the, the bananas and they'd slice them, they'd cook them and fry them, put a little, maybe put curry powder on it. Uh, they would take canned meat sometimes, give you a dab of canned meat. Came from, I saw one can came from Bulgaria, so it's impo all imported, but they would scoop it out and, and drop it in there. And, and basically, uh, that's, that's what, what they fed us. Uh, that's what they fed us. Um, uh, the dysentery, I think, you know, I had, the only time I had any effects with what you, which even vaguely resembled dysentery. I, I never, I didn't have a fever, I didn't have, you know, nothing that was collateral with that idea. But my bowels turned really watery during the first week I was there. And uh, just, you know, to give you an idea, when I sat down on that bucket, you know, that the rice went straight through me. Uh, the rice would come firing out of, out of my rear end, and it sounded like buckshot hitting the side of that. There was so much gas and pressure built up internally it would fire against that old metal bucket, which you sat on. You sat on the metal bucket. You know what you see, uh, later, later years, somebody showed me uh, how to, how to uh, improvise a seat. And that was to take my rubber sandals off, which were nothing more than slices of the uh, tread off of automobile or truck tires. And they were cut in the shape of a foot, and then the straps to hold them on your feet were made out of inner tubes, okay? So you'd take those off of your feet, and you'd carefully balance them on the lid, on the edge of the bucket, 
and then put yourself over it and sit down very carefully. Never wanted to hit it wrong and knock it into the waste bucket. Because you know, for instance, you've got eight guys uh, living there and they're all contributing to the bucket's contents. But when I lived by myself, I hadn't discovered that great innovation yet. So I was just sitting there and I had the big red ring, you know, when I got up uh, from the bucket. But uh, the only thing I could say about dysentery would be that was the closest and I think that was uh, the water, you know, whatever. You know, there were, there were no vehicles driving around so I didn't get a sense of uh, any uh, exhaust smoke or uh, I didn't, uh, I, the smells, the smells, if, if I was describe them, smells, would be when the meals were being cooked and the uh, smoke, the, the, the smell of the smoke. They used wood, uh, wood, wood and charcoal uh, balls, coal balls, uh, to uh, fuel their fires. And you'd smell the smoke, but uh, not, you know, nothing that was uh, really, really memorable in that sense. Uh, uh, the food was not, it was, you know, ra a, a, a rather a non-event in, in a sense that it was just to maintain uh, survival. Uh, and it seemed to me that there was always uh, enough food for me. I was slight build. Uh, uh, now the bigger guys, they lost a lot of weight. Uh, some of the heavier guys lost a lot of weight. And so uh, they, uh, you know, they, re they, they might have wanted more food. Put the lid on it, and it sort of sealed it off. I, I, I don't, I don't have any memory of how bad that, uh, how bad that smelled. Now cleaning the bucket, uh, you just you dumped it down, you dumped it down the uh, the pipe. When uh, and the only time I got into cleaning the bucket was uh, uh, when uh, you'd haul it out in the morning. For instance, at the zoo at the annex. And in the zoo, we had one of these walk-up, squat-down toilets. I don't know if you've ever seen one with the, with the footprints uh, that are made out of cement. And you sit there and squat, and you do your stuff through the hole. Uh, you just take the bucket out and dump it down the hole of that. And when I lived in the, uh, at, at uh, uh, the old little Las Vegas, uh, at uh, you know, the, the Hilton portion of the prison, uh, uh, the two of us would go out with the bucket, and we'd dump it down the hole, and we'd put water in a spigot, swish it around, and go like that. And there'd be a bamboo broom there, but yeah, I uh, I don't know whether I, maybe I got maybe I got desensitized to the smell or whatever it was. But uh, uh, as far as uh, now, at the zoo, at the zoo in 1968. I came down with a horrific uh, case of, uh, and you know, I don't know whether this was this would be dysentery or not, but I got up 30 times one night when the lights were out too because they had a power failure, and underneath my net, and I walked to the uh, to the bucket, and put my in the dark, put my sandals on there, and sat down and just squirted out nothing but water 30 times. But there was no smell, no odor, no, and when I went, picked it up the next day to go dump it, you know, just dumped it down the hole. I, I never had nightmares. I Nothing disrupted my sleep. When I went, uh, I, I exercised, I exercised vigorously, vigorously every single day except Sunday. And so when I finished up at the end of the day and it was time to go to bed, I, I slept soundly. He did, but he was, he was very much limited because of his stiff leg. Uh, he, uh, he, he, he'd try, he walked a lot, he walked a lot, he always had that cigarette. He always had that cigarette in his fingers too, but we'd walk a lot back and forth, back and forth. I think he did mostly walking. Then he would do upper body exercises. Uh, his 
push-ups were really funny looking. I mean, he had that one stiff arm, you know, and he was almost doing one-arm push-ups. But he, he worked on muscle tone, and uh, uh, I, don't think, I don't think I saw him run, per se. I saw him walk a lot, though. Saw him walk a lot. Not when I lived. He was treated just like the rest of us did. Were. Uh, now, early on, when he was first shot down, he got a lot of brutal treatment because they were trying to get him to, uh, you know, uh, cause embarrassment to uh, not only the country but to his family, his dad being the sink pack, the commander in chief of uh, Pacific. See, I didn't live with him then. He got shot down in October, October, and so uh, when uh, I remember seeing the film that the, I think it was a French, uh, a French or a Japanese, I can't remember company. French did did that uh, that interview with him, you know. And I remember it just tragic, bring tears to your eyes. Is tell my wife I love her, you know. That's that's all I remember. I think that's mainly what they played in the United States. Uh, now they may have uh, pub, uh, uh, played something else that he said during the interview. Uh, you know, what he was shot down. Yeah, I just saw it after his release. I got shot down in February, he was in October. In fact, just this last Thursday, it was his 50th anniversary, yeah. What a great opportunity to celebrate, huh? Solitary, my solitary confinement uh, was never in the dark. I was never locked up in pitch blackness. Uh, it would get dark sometimes when we had power failures in the camp, but it wasn't a, a it was not a darkness where my windows were uh, uh, were blocked out were blacked out, uh, and there was you know no light whatsoever. Some guys did have that sort of an experience, but um, <clears throat> talk about solita solitary confinement maybe uh, seven seven feet. Uh, by uh, four feet wide, uh, five paces back and forth between the bed board and the wall. And uh, uh, I, I walked all the time, back and forth, back and forth. And I, you know, I'd, you'd, I'd review past experiences. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, I'd dwell on the failures. I'd dwell on my failures until I learned from other POWs that we all did it. We all did it. We were caught in a situation where we looked at things through a dark lens. Uh, you know, it, we were, first of all, disappointed in getting shot down. I mean, never gonna happen to me, but it did. And now you gotta cope with it. And your immediate thoughts are always tainted, mine were, mine were always tainted or colored by the fa your failures in life, the one where you could have done better where you could have measured up a lot better. And then eventually I got over that when I learned that other guys went through it. But anyway, solitary, back and forth, pace about five, five paces back and forth, turn around, face uh, the door and walk the other direction, back and forth, back and forth. I thought about uh, plans to, uh, for the future, what I was gonna do when I got out. I always kept tried to keep an optimistic outlook. Uh, I thought I, I, I uh, thought about plans in building uh, an A-frame house on a piece of property I had. I talked about my my investments in the stock market. I had just started when I got shot down, and I re I, I just reviewed those and talked. About, I thought about the dividends, how they accrue, things like that. And when I got out, I never thought about how much money I was going to have, because being a bachelor, uh, all my money was being saved for me. My father saved all my money for me. But I didn't learn that until after I came home. But uh, I knew it was going into the 10% savings plan. The government set up a 10% savings plan for us overseas for your base pay. For your, your, your base pay would go into the bank and earn 10%, uh, okay? Uh, so, so I knew that was going on. But, uh, but as far as back and forth, I prayed a lot. Uh, I made myself a, a, a rosary out of a piece of rope, and I used to uh, count the mysteries on the, the knots, you know, back and forth. I had uh, 10 knots on a, on a piece of twine that I found uh, in, in the courtyard 
and I was out one day. And, uh, and so I just occupied, I occupied my day just with those, and communicating, and communicating. Communicating was a big part of it. You could occupy, and inf good information was always a, a lift. That was always a lift. And then, you know, uh, exercise took up part of the time. And then uh, uh, meal time came, about uh, 11 o'clock or so, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And then uh, you go take, uh, take a nap, take your siesta. Uh, and, and from, uh, I don't know, 11.30 to 2 o'clock was the siesta. It's a good way to pass uh, your time in jail. You sleep it off. You know, it's gone. The night I got shot down, I was thinking that I'd be there no, lo no longer than uh, the uh, end of 1968. Because as I was pacing back and forth between interrogations, I said, you know, Lyndon Johnson's going to do something to end this war before his reelection in 1968, the election of November of 68. So he is going to bring this war to a close and I'll go home. So I thought I would be, I would be there, uh, you know, less than two years, or less, you know, less than two years, yeah. I remember the, uh, the story because uh, John, John wrote it, it because John was living in the same room with Mike Christian. Um, I, I lived with Mike Christian for a while, and I was a very upbeat, happy guy, uh, very, very hard-nosed resistor. Uh, but as far as the flag, um, I, 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 I don't remember whether he had it with him when I lived in the, the same room or not. But John was, knew it firsthand. He knew that firsthand when he came back in the room after being beaten by that. Uh, you remember the picture of uh, John Dramisi, uh, who incidentally I understand just passed away. Uh, John Dramisi was holding the American flag out the window of the bus. I've got a picture of that in there too. Uh, John Dramisi made that flag and kept it hidden. He kept it hidden. And uh, I don't know whether he displayed it, because that's how Mike Christian got caught. They displayed it for the patriotic portion of their, uh, I think, of their Sunday worship service. Yeah, we always started our church service with uh, briefly pledge of if it, if it was not an if it was not an expanded service like John and I conducted, it would have been uh, like it was in solitary confinement when I first got there. Bump on the wall, face to the east, uh, uh, Lord's Prayer, uh, uh, maybe 23rd Psalm was a big favorite, Pledge of Allegiance, and then any other, uh, any other uh, meditations or prayers that you wanted. Uh, so probably that's what the, he had the flag displayed, and they did the Pledge of Allegiance. And the guard, the guard saw it probably, and uh, that's how it happened. But I don't, I wasn't in a room when when that happened. Oh yeah, I was in the same room with McCain. We were living in the same room, and um, what I remember leading up to it was. Um, uh, In May, in May of 72, President Nixon resumed intensive bombing in the North, okay? Because I, I recall the North Vietnamese launched an offensive in the Northern provinces and President Nixon responded with heavy bombing In May, when he started bombing, when he started bombing, um, the Vietnamese took the bulk of the prisoners that were living in unity 
okay, wallow, uh, the other side of the actual Hilton in, uh, in, in downtown Hanoi, took the bulk of those prisoners and moved them up to the Chi near the Chinese border. Virtually emptied the camp. And they left only a small number of us, I think about 13 of us, living in a room along with the senior officers who were scattered all over. And we lived in that small room all that time uh, after the group had left and gone up near the Chinese border. We started hearing on the radio negotiations uh, going on in, in Paris and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, du the duplicious, uh, misleading American actions to prevent peace from coming, all that. And as, as uh, the year went on and we approached September, we started hearing things on the uh, Voice of Vietnam, which led me to believe anyway, that the, the, the war might end with a peace agreement because of what Kissinger was quoted as saying, okay, leading up to, I think October when he said, peace is at hand. I think it was October he said, peace is at hand, because that was, that was that, and, and the North Vietnamese poo-pooed that. They were very negative about it, and indeed, they turned their back and walked away. They, they pulled the rug out from underneath Henry Kissinger, and he was very upset, and so was the president, because they thought they had an agreement to end the war. <clears throat> and so time just sort of percolated along for a while. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, on the 18th of uh, December, just the whole city of Hanoi and the whole sky just lit up with explosions. And from then, round the clock, bombing and just triple-A and Sam's going off. And uh, just the guys were absolutely ecstatic. And I thought, the war's probably gonna be over. This is it, this is a coup de grace. This is the big, the final blow. It's either do your stuff or get off the pot. And we, uh, we, we saw the bombing all around the clock, the lights in the sky, that saddest, the saddest, night I ever saw my entire life was when a B-52 was hit by a SAM and exploded and the, the remnants of it just came cascading down through the sky like a, a, I don't know if you've ever been to Yosemite National Park, but they used to have a firefalls thing. They used to roll fire off the, uh, the mountain and it used to be a firefall, they called it. But anyway, that's what it reminded me of. It was just a tumbling mass of burning metal, and you know, I thought about guys inside there dying. The next morning, they let us out for exercise and all that. And strangely enough, there wasn't any adverse action taken against the POWs, except for the fact that they did po they did uh, uh, put. Uh, guys with AK-47 standing uh, in the windows, okay? Just so, in, in I'm not sure all windows, but it's cer certainly one window, so they could keep an eye on the POWs in case this offense, offense of uh, air power uh, was the start of a commando raid or a, a, a wholesale riot on our part or something like that. But they did put guards in the windows. They were very agitated but they never took any, I never experienced seeing any action, any action against us in retaliation. It, all, the, all the guys were excited. They said, this is the end, but this, it's gonna end right now. The war is gonna come to a close. And then for Christmas, they stopped the bombing in, in observance of the Christmas holidays. And then boom, resembled it right after Christmas, they resumed it again, okay? By that time, the, uh, the the harbor had been, they had already blockaded the harbor. Uh, Nixon had already, uh, 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 not blockaded, but uh, mined the harbor and the waterways so they weren't getting the supplies they needed to replenish their SAMs and all the other ammunition. 
and they couldn't get it overland because you know it had to come through China, and they weren't exactly on great terms at that time, the Chinese and the Vietnamese. And so uh, the bombing resumed then after Christmas, and we, we were very upbeat, we were very upbeat, never, did not hear as many SAMs being fired uh, as we had earlier. And then, and then uh, the announcement on the radio came that uh, they were gonna sign, I think it was on the 24th of January, that uh, they were going to sign the agreement to end the war. So this, the bombing went from the 11th to the 29th and uh, uh, 18 days, uh, wait a minute, that's not right. Uh, see, 11 days of Christmas would have been, no, excuse me, uh, the 18th to the 29th, that's what it was, the 18th to the 29th, and uh, uh, 11 days of Christmas, yeah. And so uh, uh, when that bombing was over, uh, there was a real strange, a very strange silence, and then the announcement on the radio that on the, that they were gonna they were gonna sign an agreement to end the war. Over the radio, they said that um, we'll be uh, <clears throat> when they sign the agreement on the twenty seventh of January of seventy three, that we have to be notified within five days. The agreement said we have to be no POWs have to be notified within five days uh, that we're gonna go home and in what process, okay? And we'll go home in the order of shoot down date. The earliest, like Alvarez, uh, would go first and then the latter part, of the people got shot down in, in uh, 72, late 70, they, and maybe somebody in 73, if they got shot down then, they would go home, they would go home after that. I was in the second, the second large group, the 4th of, Mar 4th of March. We had a uh, uh, kind of a think tank that the, bo that the boss in the room wanted a few of us to join. So he appointed us to do some contingency planning. For instance, if, if, a, if a commando raid was staged, what were we going to do? If the Vietnamese came in here with their guns blazing, how are we gonna survive some of that? Uh, and then in the process, my group started talking about release. And I chimed in and I said to him, I said, you know, if we're gonna be released as military people, I want my flight suit back. I wanna leave here as I came in, dressed in my flight suit. Because years ago, one of my <clears throat> cellmates told me that he had seen a storage room with all the flight suits hanging in them, an accumulation of flight suits taken from Americans. <clears throat> and in fact, there's one in the, uh, the museum there at, in Hanoi I've got a picture of. But um, so I told him, I said, I want to go home dressed in my flight suit, my military flight suit. And I said, if they will not give me my flight suit, I think we should refuse we refuse to go home until they give us a uniform, okay? Because my belief was that the, it, that the military, the Department of Defense could fly in the, the proper service uniforms for all the POWs. Wouldn't make any difference if it fit or did not fit, whether it was baggy or whatever. It was still a uniform because I don't wanna leave here being accused of being a criminal or typed as a criminal, a war criminal. So I didn't carry the day, obviously, because one of the guys, the senior guys in my little group said, listen, if we're gonna go home, we're gonna go home. We're not, we're not gonna quibble over how we're dressed. So uh, within the five days, within the five days, of the signing on the 27th of January, we were formed up in the courtyard. And the camp commander got up there, the Vietnamese camp commander said, okay, you're gonna go home in three large groups in this sequence, okay. 
the guys that were shot down, like Alvarez, 64, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and so forth, will go home first. And then <clears throat> the next group, the next group will go home, the second group will go home on the, on uh, uh, the, uh, it, it wasn't the fourth, it wasn't the fourth of March. They delayed me uh, after the first, the first group went home on the 12th of February. Okay. And then two weeks later, I was supposed to be released in that large group. But it was held up because there were allegations by the North Vietnamese of treaty violations down south. And so they dilly-dallied around and finally got it settled and released us on the 4th of March. Now, I was in my room in, uh, John had moved out. John had moved out by that time because when, when they announced we were gonna be released in, cert in three segments, okay, then what the, what the, what the, uh, the camp commander did was he started parceling us out in different rooms according to our release dates, okay? So John was moved to a, to a, a group that was gonna be released after me, okay? And so I was in my room that particular day <clears throat> that, that this rearrangement of, of POWs was going to take place. And a guard came in, an officer actually came in and said, uh, we're going to have a release of a special group of people for Henry Kissinger. <clears throat> there are going to be 20 people. And he started calling off the names of the people in my room that were going to be released. And boy, man, these guys were up and off like a shot. They were off like a shot. And so they left... Um, uh, the uh, 18th of uh, February. So the first group was released on the 12th, then the 18th was the 20th that were released for Kissinger. And I think I explained to you that, that they picked the 20. Uh, Kissinger refused to, to pick the 20. He said, I want our POWs to go home in, according, in accordance with the day they were shot down the longest held first, and then, and of course, the most recent. And so what happened was when he said that, they still went through with this announcement that they were gonna release a special group on the, on the occasion of Henry Kissinger's visit to Hanoi. And so they picked, they picked the 20 people. And then after they went on the 18th, then, then we went home on March the 4th. And uh, that was about 100 and, I think 106 guys in my group. John was in another room by that time. And, uh, and so, because he was going to be released after us. Uh, but what they gave to us when we moved to these, speci these specified rooms uh, that were uh, associated with a release date, they gave us the clothes. They gave us a, a duffel bag Okay, which I said, I don't want. I said, I've been here. I know what goes on. I don't want to take any souvenirs home. So a lot of guys took their cup. A lot of, they took their toothbrush and they took, you know, things home with them. I said, I don't, I don't need anything to remind me of this. So I left the duffel bag and I got a pair of uh, nondescript clothes, which I still have hanging in the closet here. If later on you want to look at them. But uh, they were just... Uh, Foreign-made or Vietnamese-made clothing, slacks, shirt, and a and a jacket, a pair of, and a pointed, uh, pointy-toed shoes, and that sort of thing. Now, I wasn't happy with it, but uh, that's what uh, that's that's what we got, and that's what we were supposed to to, to wear out. Interestingly enough, uh, Jim Peary, who was the naval officer in charge of that group of twenty people, when he saw the makeup of those POWs being released as not being consistent with when uh, they were shot down. In other words, some late shoot downs were going home before early shoot downs in my list. He says, I refuse to take these guys out. Oh, 
right down from the top, the word came to him, shut your mouth, take your t other 19 guys, and get on that airplane. Says, You're not going to turn this apple cart upside down now. We work to negotiate. And it's right. It's, it, it, it's correct. It, it's, it's what should have been done. Nobody cheered. Nobody cheered until the airplane actually lifted off the ground and, and the, the landing gear uh, was retracted. Everybody else was just talking quietly, just talking quiet because I, I knew we were going to, I knew we were going to go. I didn't have any ominous feelings, but some guys, some guys said, I'm not going to believe it until it actually happens. I mean, it, it, you know, they'd been there for such a long time. They were skeptical about that. I, I didn't have any. After the bombing, we drove, we drove to the airport and, and that beat up old bus. You can't believe the devastation that our B-52s and other airplanes wreaked on those uh, targets. It's uh, the bus, the, 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 the bridge, we, the Dormer Bridge, uh, which was a target, uh, which we, we drove across was nothing but, uh, really, nothing but wooden planks. We were riding on wooden planks. It was so beat up. Alongside, I noticed uh, railroad cars just burned out hulks. Uh, it really, uh, it's, it was obvious that Nixon and Kissinger were very serious about bringing that thing to an end right then. And, uh, and they did, and they did bring it in. They, they, they opened up the gates of, uh, of hell, so to speak, and just showed those people, in a sense, they showed them what total war is like. Oh, it was a great feeling, great feeling. Landed at Clark. I, I was, uh, I started crying. I started crying. And you know why? It was because the whole route primarily was lined with children. Primarily with children. I mean, these kids, these kids had every conceivable type of sign, homemade, all of them homemade, welcome home. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we love you, all that sort of, some of them had favorite POWs that they had been wearing the bracelets and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I will, I'll never forget, and this is when I really broke down. We were driving down the road and we were getting ready to turn, we slowed down getting ready in the big, we call them blue goose, the big blue buses. We turned around and started heading to the hospital. And some kid, some kid threw through the window a uh, re religious medallion on a train chain, uh, a Catholic medallion, and that, that just that just did it. I just fell apart. I said, "This is incredible." I I get kind of emotional when I think of it right now. But these these kids, uh, they didn't have an axe to grind. They weren't anti this. They were only pro pro POWs and all that stuff. And uh, they they just they just let it all out. They let it all out, and we got to the, we got into the hospital, and uh, and I was walking down the, I was walking down the hall to go to my room, and uh, coming down the other direction was the only female that, that I knew existed as a POW up north, and that was Monica Schwinn, the German, uh, the German nurse. I think she was a German nurse working on behalf. Of, a, of an agency, you know, for to help the South, South Vietnamese people. And she had big dark circles under her eyes, and she wasn't very tall, she wasn't a very big woman. But uh, she walked down the other way. And then I got a little anecdote, I tell you. I got into the, first thing I had to do is, you know, one of my, one of my cellmates for years and years kept telling me, we all got worms. We all got worms. I said, no, I don't have worms. I, we all got worms. Yeah, we all got worms. I mean, my rear end didn't itch. I didn't have any signs of it. When I went to the bathroom, I didn't. You know, one of my roommates passed two worms that big. That big. Big black things. They were about that big around. Uh, Three-eighths of an inch in diameter. Yeah, it's just, I mean, I wonder why he was so skinny. It was because worms were eating all his food. But... Uh, I never had any problem. My appetite was always good. Never had a scratchy rear end. Uh, when I went to the bathroom, I never saw any pinworms or anything like that. Yeah, we all got worms. We all got a nice fill. 
No, we don't have worms. I don't have worms. So I go to the, uh, so I go to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the nurse, and uh, she says, "I want a stool sample." I said, "Okay, okay." So she hands me. Uh, are you familiar with Foster's Old Fashioned? You know what uh, uh, Thirty One Flavors uh, ice cream does? They, they give you a cup, and you can put ice cream in a in a paper cup. Mm-hmm. You, you familiar with that? Sort of. Yeah, yeah. You're too young. Anyway, Foster's Old Fashioned Freeze was is very soft serve thing. Anyway, that's what I grew up with. Anyway, but it's a cup about that big around. Uh, I want a stool sample. I said, okay, all right. So she gives me this cup and a lid to put on it. And she says, okay, I want you to bring it back to the nurse's station. I said, okay. So I go to the stool sample, put the lid on it, and I gave it to the nurse's station. I went back to my room. I've been up for almost 36 hours now. I hadn't slept. And uh, so I go back and uh, sit in my room. And pretty soon... Pretty soon I heard this call over the, over the uh, PA system. Captain Fur, report to the nurse's station at X, Y, or Z. I said, I wonder what they want. Anyway, I got it. And I walked down. I got my robe on. Same clothes I had when I saw in that picture there, that nondescript prison stuff. So I walked down there. And there's this old grumpy major, female major nurse, standing there. And she's looking at me. She's got this cup in her hand. She says, Captain, what's the meaning of this? And so far, I don't know what's going on. And she reaches, and she pulls the lid off. And one of my POW buddies had taken that brown lump of excrement and his shaving cream and made a swirl on the top of it like it was a chocolate sundae. I said, I have no idea. I said, she said, don't kid me. I said, I said you asked me for a, for a sample, and I, I gave the nurse a sample. I have no idea. Well, go get another one. So she took that thing and dumped it in the, in the hazardous waste, I guess. Gave me another cup, and I got through that one. But that was, I, I, I'll never forget that. It was, it was absolutely hilarious. Nobody ever fessed up to it. And they did find pinworms. They did find pinworms. Yeah, yeah. I was overwhelmed by the attention, overwhelmed by the attention. And uh, I, I was invited by my old elementary schools, by uh, my junior high school, to come back and talk with them. So many of them had written letters for me. Because I was, you know, I talked to you about my dad being well known in town. San Pedro was only, or Pedro as we call it, a port of Los Angeles, is only, uh, at those times, at that time, it was only about 40,000 40, people. It was small. You knew everybody. Uh, virtually only had one high school, besides the Catholic high school. We had one public high school, one uh, middle school, or junior high school. And, but anyway, um, and I graduated from both of them. But anyway, um, uh, so... I was invited to the schools to come back and talk to, and some of my my friends were now uh, school principals, and so they had an inside track of getting hold of me and all that. And my brother had been holding home, holding the fort at home, uh, answering all the letters on my behalf while I was a POW and all that sort of thing. My folks had been going to these different briefings that were put on by the Air Force, and uh, and so. I was wired into this this thing, uh, this whole homecoming thing, and so I was just blown away by the attention. Churches, I spoke at I don't know how many, how many churches and schools and and service clubs, Kiwanis, uh, you know the Lions Club, all of these these people that had supported us, and I felt obligated. I really felt obligated. I I felt that I had to do it to say thanks. And then on the seventh of April. On the 7th of April, my hometown had a welcome home John Fur thing. I mean, this was big time stuff. Uh, my dad being on the fire department, they sent a helicopter down and they picked me up down at the police station. I was in my uniform. They flew me to my old 
football field at the high school. Okay, we landed there. The pom-pom girls are lining the way and they're waving their pom-poms and all that stuff. And the stands where I used to run track and play football were jammed. They're jammed. And I walked down there and the mayor of Los Angeles was there. The assemblyman uh, that represented us in the legislature were there. Uh, the congressman wasn't there, but he, he sent a representative. And all these high rollers, all these high rollers are there on the stand and my mom and dad and me. Okay, and so we had this big, big welcome home. At the end, the Chamber of Commerce, who put this thing on, had printed up certificates, had certificates of thanks to these people for supporting me while I was a POW. So the idea was, and we did it, was for me to stand there after I made my speech, my thank you speech and all that, was to stand at the head of a, re a reception line and all the people who had their, my bracelet, who had worn my bracelet, come down through the reception line, and as they either returned the bracelet or said welcome home and all that, I would give them a certificate that I had signed and thank you. So we did that, and uh, 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 well, I don't know for a couple of hours they passed all, uh, all they all passed through the line, and then that night they had a big dinner at the church auditorium that was jammed. And all my athletic coaches, track and football and, and gymnastics and the rest of them, were the bartenders. They tended the bar. The local Croatian uh, restaurant owner, had, who made wonderful food, he catered this thing. And we sat up on the stage with my mom and dad and other representatives and that sort of stuff. And that's where they gave me a television set and, you know, uh, uh, any other surplus funds that were left over from buy, from selling the tickets uh, and the Chamber of Commerce gave to me. So uh, uh, that was the welcome home. And, and I kept talking. I kept talking until I went off to Command and Staff College. I knew before I got shot down that there was the anti-war feeling and all that sort of stuff. But I didn't know the extent of the abuse that was... Uh, it, it, that was imposed on the, the GIs and, that came home from South Vietnam or Laos or, or you know, those that fought in Cambodia, uh, when, uh, as opposed to what I enjoyed. We had, because of all the attention that had built up, built up, built up, built up through the media, through the politics, uh, through the grassroots, had grown up and then culminated with Operation Homecoming, uh, all of that was just absolutely mind-boggling. But what I didn't know was the extent of abuse that the other uh, soldiers down south and sailors, Marines, experienced when they came home, how they were uh, ridiculed and how they were uh, called baby killers and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of it was because of that Cali, Lieutenant Cali uh, uh, massacre thing, a, a lot of uh, things that John Kerry uh, said, uh, you know, in his testimony about the, the uh, 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 veterans against the war, Vietnam veteran against the war, and that sort of thing. All of that had built up such that we were, and this, is, this still bothers me, uh, and I've recently written about it, but we were put in a special category of adulation, so to speak. And then the guys, some of the 500 what, 545,000, whatever, fought down south, got none of it. They got none of it. They got the short end of the stick on everything. And uh, eventually a lot of them suffered from the Agent Orange. A lot of them had mental uh, uh, problems, abuse of, of uh, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, substance abuse. Uh, now we had some that had uh, family problems as POWs and they were divorced uh, by their wives in absentia. But uh, uh, they had some of that down south. They had, uh, as I say, substance abuse. Uh, they had uh, a, a spiritual disconnect, which I think is a real serious thing uh, in that uh, they gave up on their faith of in, in, in what's good, and, and, and some of them did anyway, you know, about, about the goodness of life. And, and they were told that the cause they fought for was ig ignoble rather than noble. And, uh, 
uh, it, it, it was a, a, a down a downbeat. They were they, they they were looked at negatively, and here we were on this side, you know, looked at as some sort of heroes. And like Charlie Plum says in his book, "I'm no hero." I don't think any POW, former POW, will ever say he was a hero. I saw him in October, I think it was October of 73, when we were released, when I went to his house in, uh, I don't know whether it was Arlington or Alexandria or whether it was in Alexandria. D. Is Alexandria? Okay. Uh, Nancy and I were in town for the Navy Air Force football game. And he said, I don't, <laughs> I think if I, if I remember right, he says, it's probably sacrilegious, he said, but I'm going to invite you Air Force guys to this barbecue and we're going to burn some steaks together. So, Nancy and I went over with some of the other guys, uh, and we went to his apartment uh, where he and Carol played really gracious uh, hosts. And uh, I don't think I saw the kids. I don't, little Sydney, I'd heard so much of uh, Little Sydney and the boys uh, uh, so much when talking with him in, in Vietnam. Uh, but I think they, they were with the babysitter. But I, I'm not sure. But anyway, we went in there and. I'm telling you, the place was chaotic. It was, there were former POWs, I bet you Gamboa was, Frank Gamboa was there. This place was just covered with Navy and, and Air Force guys and the Marines, and the Marines had a couple of guys there, the whole thing. And uh, uh, I went out in the kitchen, I says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, what was he trying? I'm trying to burn some steaks or cook some steaks I forgot what it was. He jabs one of them and he throws it on the grill and uh, we cooked up, cooked up the meat and we had all the side dishes and all that stuff. It was really a great opportunity, but that was, that was when I saw him. That was when I saw him uh, when I came home. And the reason I didn't see him at a hospital is because being Navy, I think he went to Bethesda, but I'm not sure. I think with the set then I was out in the West Coast at March Air Force Base Hospital. In fact, uh, I was in line when we went through the reception that day. Uh, uh, we walked across the stage, and uh, I remember him coming across. He's on crutches. I remember him going across. I think he went across before me. And then uh, I had a card of thanks I wanted to give the president. So I, this is funny. I didn't realize all these things took place at, uh, at that time. But I got my card, and I walked up, uh, and I'm about to shake hands with uh, President Nixon. and. I, I had my card, and I said, Mr. President, I'd like to, and his aide, uh, Secret Service guy, reached over and grabbed the, grabbed the envelope out of my hand, and he says, I'll give that to the president. So I shook hands with him and all that stuff, and it was really nice. It was very, very nice. But I want to, I want to, I want to, I have an anecdote, and I got a picture in there. It shows me with, with President Nixon, with Nancy and I. In 1978, John put together the fifth anniversary of our release, at the Western White House, okay, out in San Clemente. And so uh, I, Nancy and I flew from Colorado because I was at the academy at the time as an air officer commanding anyway. So we flew in there and we flew into uh, Clemente. We took the bus ride down from the, I think it was a Marriott in LA, uh, and all the way down to, to San Clemente. And uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I was, we were standing in line and uh, one of the uh, one of the guys, one of the guys behind me, one of the guys behind me, uh, gave me a camera and said, "Will you take the picture of me and my wife when we come up to the president?" Okay, and of course I had my camera too, and and so uh, he comes up, and and in the meantime I'm taking pictures of other people as well as they come through, okay. And then this guy comes up, and I take his picture, and I give him the camera. And then Nancy comes up. She's in line next, and I have my camera. And I said, Mr. President, can I get a picture of uh, you and my wife, Nancy? And I, I click it off. He says, your wife? He says, well, who are all those other women you were taking a picture of? 
I said, oh, they're just friends. They're just friends. But I've got that picture there where he's asking me that question. It's really funny. But anyway, yeah, I, uh, I saw him in, in, in 78. And then I saw him one time at a, at a we had a reunion in Washington, D.C. Not too long after that. And then I don't know whether I told you this story, but I was, I was at the Pentagon at the time, uh, probably about 1979, I think, or 80. And uh, I used to ride the shuttle back and forth from the Pentagon to the House or the Senate office building. And this particular time I was going to the Senate office building because I had to do some work for the Air Force Academy. I was their, uh, their uh, uh, guy in charge of the office in the Pentagon for the, the Academy out in Colorado. So I, was, I always had to go over to explain to the senator why their son was guilty of an honor viol or either a constituent was guilty of an honor violation and was going to re resign. But anyway, so I was over there waiting for my shuttle bus, and I see this guy who looks familiar coming out of one of the Senate uh, exits to a, a little mini hatchback car parked there by the curb. And he, he comes around and he starts loading groceries in the back of this hatchback. I said, John, what are you doing? And he looks over and he's still loading them in there. He says, ah, Senator Tower and I are going to China. And if you've ever eaten that Chinese food over there, it's terrible stuff. And he doesn't like it. And he wants to bring our own food over there. So we're bringing our own food. So we're loading it up like that and slammed it shut. And he drove off wherever he was going to go. But uh, I... I, I unfortunately haven't been able to see him as often as I want to see him. But uh, when I have, it's, it's, it's been interesting, been very interesting. You know what I wasn't happy about? What I wasn't happy about diplomatic relations, uh, we, we establish them with people on a basis of, di of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, diplomacy and, and you know, uh, 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 protocols and things like that for sometimes it's 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 advantageous to do it because it's the first step to, to greater things. What I wasn't happy about uh, was that we didn't hold over the North Vietnamese heads or the Vietnamese heads the fullest possible accounting of our POWs that were missing or I mean our our our, our airmen and soldiers that were still missing in action, unaccounted for. And I'll tell you why. When I worked in the Pentagon as the advisor for principal, for the principal advisor for POW and MI affairs to Casper Weinberger, for instance, okay, <clears throat> I was in international security affairs. We made a special trip. We made a special trip to Hanoi. We made a special trip with a stack, as I recall, about 26 uh, dossiers of people, men, who had yet to be accounted for, that we had heard on the ground talking on their radio, or known to have ejected from their airplane and got out successfully, okay? But nothing more. What happened to them? So we, I, I went with Rich Armitage, who was the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, at that time, my boss. And we went and we sat down across from the Vietnamese. I had a State Department guy with me, uh, jo a Joint Chiefs of Staff guy, uh, and then there was the linguist who translated them. And we handed them this stack of 26 and, and Armitage communicated back and forth. First, very cleverly, uh, after he let the translator do the interpreting, very cleverly put his hand over on the translator's wrist and as if to say I'll take it from here and he spoke in fluent Vietnamese to the ranking guy on that that group of men sitting across the table he says we want an accounting of these people here I wish we had now this was in the 80s uh, and and I wish we had followed up on that with the normalization of relations between us and the Vietnamese the headline that I have downstairs, if I remember correctly, Clinton, it was Clinton uh, puts trade first. He didn't say anything about accounting for the missing in action, accounting for the, uh, the uh, 
people, the guys that we knew were alive but didn't come home, that sort of thing. That's what dis disappointed me about the, uh, the normalization. I would like to have said, yeah, we'll normalize, but I want help in accounting for those guys. You know, my three crew members who finally came home, 1967, the first, the first remains came home in 77. The next one, just three years ago, the last two guys, three years ago. Took that long? Ah, baloney. They, uh, they're not, they, they, they weren't trying. They weren't trying. I would like to think that, his op that, that the president's opposition research went back and they looked at all the comments that were made about John when he was running for the Republican nomination uh, against George Bush. I happened to be in South Carolina and stuffed, in, uh, stuffed uh, campaign flyers for him uh, at, in, the, in the neighborhood, okay? In the Sumter Daily Item, a, he was, he was higher than a master sergeant in the army who was a military advisor on Admiral Moore's committee, which was advising George Bush, George W., okay, for the campaign on military affairs. That guy made a public statement to a reporter, which was presented, which was printed in a newspaper that John McCain's not qualified to be a president. After all, he said, anybody can fly around up there and get shot down. Now, I'd like to think that what Trump did was he told his ops research guys to go back and start looking at things like this because that's almost exactly verbatim what he said about John McCain getting shot down. It's grossly unfair. It's grossly un and it's grossly untrue. And I wrote a letter to the editor, which I still have, saying that that, that army guy get a, did a gross, uh, a, a gross disrespect toward every single former POW in any war whatsoever. And I got good response from it. But I wrote in defense of him because of that. But that army guy, who should have known better, said anybody can fly around up there and get shot down. It's the same thing. I, when I saw what uh, Trump said that, I thought, hey, what's going on? What the hell's going on here? Are we just reading the old mail? That's all we got? Isn't, I'm going to give you another anecdote. 2003, I guess it was. Remember the book I, I showed you that uh, John autographed for me? Uh, worth fighting for? I brought my cousin and my brother to Borders. Can we get in line? And uh, we're working our way up through the, through the line. And, and I'm getting close to, to, to the table where John's sitting. And uh, about 30 feet away, a head pops up behind the stack of books, the new books that Borders has got for sale there. And, and this lady says, Senator McCain, I understand. You're the Manchurian candidate. And John finishes a sentence that he's right, and he looks up and he says, that's right, lady, I am. <laughs> it just, she shriveled into nothing because nobody argued, nobody did anything. So I, I'm next up there, I go up there, I'm, I'm the next one in line, I got my brother and my, my cousin who's told only two books, and he's got two armloads of John's books, and he's standing there like this, and he looks up, he says, John, my friend! And, and so he says, to, to Mark, he says, Mark, take him in the back room, buy him a Coke, do something, take him in the back room. So we went in the back room and sat there and chatted and chatted and chatted and chatted, and then John showed up when he got done. But I thought that was classic. I mean, just like water off his back, okay? Just like water off the duck's back, okay? Just, you know, my mother always used to say, yes them to death and they'll go away. <laughs> That's what that lady did, nobody argued with her. Just disagree with her. Then she goes. <laughs>